So next in our itinerary for the day, we have um, a number of panelists coming on to speak to us from across the world. So we have uh, David Wilder, who is based out of the United States, and he is a writer covering topics like psychedelics, spirituality, technology, and self-development. He writes for the Psychedelic Times, Reality Sandwich, and his own blog, Thank you, Wilder. Uh, we also have Rita Kosarova coming in from the Czech Republic. Uh, she's a, a master's and PhD candidate and junior researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health and the research program of social, social psychiatry, as well as being a PhD student of clinical psychology at Charles University in Prague. Uh, we hello. have, oh, hello, sorry, I'm just gonna finish everyone's things and then I'll let you all do an introduction of yourself because I'm sure you all know yourselves much better than I do. Um, so we also have Anne Wagner, who is a researcher out of Ryerson University. Um, she's been doing some re uh, research with MAPS on uh, MDMA, uh, pairing that with uh, CBT. And we also have Trevor Millar from uh, British Columbia. He's the owner of Liberty Root Therapy Limited, um, and that serves the function of um, providing people healing experiences uh, with the African plant medicine Iboga and its der derivatives. We also have Alison McMahon, who is providing us a voice from the cannabis research and the cannabis movement. Uh, she's the CEO of Cannabis at Work, which is a leading source in cannabis for cannabis jobs, recruitment services, online industry training, and so on. And, uh, she's also a certified HR uh, professional. So I'd like to give each of you a few minutes to introduce yourselves, uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing and uh, your experiences in the field. So uh, why don't we start off more or less in the order that I presented there. David, would you like to go ahead and give yourself uh, an introduction? Let us know what you've been up to. Sure. So yeah, um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the organizers uh, that put on this event and also the Toronto Psychedelic Society. And thanks to uh, Ben Sessa for that great talk. There was a lot of awesome information in there. Um, my name is David Wilder, and I'm a freelance writer and blogger. I write about topics like psychedelics and spirituality, uh, technology, self-development. Um, I wasn't always a supporter of psychedelics or uh, any drug use at all, really. I was fairly anti-drug growing up. Um, live in the United States uh, in kind of an anti-drug society and went to a bunch of like dare education or miseducation classes. Uh, when I was uh, growing up, so I wasn't really a, a big friend of the psychedelic community uh, to begin with. Um, I had a lot of uh, depression and uh, like anger issues that um, that I, I had to deal with um, that psychedelics ended up helping me out with. Um, and uh, during so yeah, so during college, I, I started to kind of experiment with you know alcohol and cannabis and. Um, uh, eventually had kind of a mind-blowing experience with salvia divinorum um, that kind of put me off into a different direction um, and really taught me that these things are to be respected. Um, and uh, at that point, I started consuming a lot of psychedelic content, a lot of books and uh, podcasts and documentaries and things like that. Uh, just learning as much as I could. I just became like a sponge and just really wanted to learn everything I could uh, about psychedelics. It just became kind of like a fascination for me. Um, I ended up graduating from college with a journalism degree uh, and ended up working in the technology industry um, and really kind of right after college set my writing to the side. I uh, didn't do a whole lot of that. But uh, about five years ago, I started writing for uh, Reality Sandwich, and I was writing about uh, just kind of recapping psychedelic news that was happening um, and uh, doing a lot of transcriptions for them uh, for interviews. So I would just transcribe what was said in the interviews. Um, eventually, I started uh, my own blog, which is Think Wilder, uh, and I kind of took over... Um, a column that had been on Reality Sandwich was called This Week in Psychedelics. I kind of took over that uh, when the person who was doing it stopped. And um, so I released that each week on uh, Reality Sandwich and also on Think Wilder. Uh, it's just kind of um, links to articles about psychedelics and other psychoactives that, uh, that show up throughout the week. Um, also on my blog, I write a lot of book reviews because I'm a pretty avid book reader. And um, I write a lot about meditation and yoga. I've got like a how-to series on um, different meditation techniques. 
Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, writing for Psychedelic Times. Um, I have put together a lot of resource lists on like books uh, and podcasts, uh, psychedelic organizations that you should check out. And uh, I also focus a lot on harm reduction. Um, I've written some articles on like, reagent drug testing kits and uh, selecting like an appropriate dosage level for the first time that you try a new drug. Um, I've written some how-to articles on like how to come out of the psychedelic closet to your parents, um, companion activities that can enhance your psychedelic experience, like meditation and yoga and dancing and journaling, uh, things like that. Um, I've written about um, Sas Sasha Shulgin's rating scale, which people can use to help uh, determine or describe their psychedelic experiences, uh, and about Tripsit's uh, drug combinations chart. Um, I'm really just into harm reduction and making sure that people are doing these things safely, as, as safely as possible, uh, to get the most out of it and also um, just be safe. Uh, and uh, recently I've been writing a little bit more about uh, psychedelic research, like um, cluster headaches uh, research and MDMA uh, being used for treating eating disorders uh, and cannabis being used to treat PTSD in US military veterans. Um, and last year I wrote an article uh, called Continuing Education or Continuing Further Education with Psychedelics, um, which is just really meant to show people different things that they could study in grad school uh, related to psychedelics. So uh, at this point, my goal is just to continue growing as a writer and producing uh, even better content for the psychedelic community. And that pretty much sums it up for me. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, and I was wondering, actually, could you give us just a brief rundown of what is happening this week in psychedelics, if there's anything interesting and new? <laughs> Let's see here. Um, let's see, there's a new LSD study that had uh, come out showing that there was uh, like a harmonic reorganization of the brain uh, when uh, using LSD, which is pretty interesting. Uh, the Beckley Foundation is uh, planning to study links between microdosing LSD and creativity. Um, there's some news that was pretty interesting coming out showing that uh, psilocybin mushrooms may have developed psilocybin uh, to keep insects away from them, uh, which was, I found pretty interesting. Um, and th those are some of the, the main highlights. Uh, there, a lot of the articles I share uh, aren't as, as big as those, but I, I try to get as much as I can in that column. So uh, if anyone ever has anything that they think that I'd want to put in there, then feel free to, to send it over to me. Excellent. Yeah, um, I was taking a look at that. It's a, an excellent resource for sure. And that's very interesting about the insect thing. It's a bit different from the narrative that often um, we get about, you know, facilitating human evolution and creating symbiotic relationships between plants and people and such. Um, so it's interesting bringing it um, down to earth. Um, it's the direction the research is going now, which is excellent. Um, so Rita, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your experiences. I know you're also a co-founder of the Psychedelic Society in the Czech Republic. Um, how are things over on your end? Yep. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Dan. Thanks also to, to everyone uh, for putting together this great event. Thanks for having me. I'm honored and uh, happy to be here to, to share a bit about my uh, psychedelic career, its pitfalls and also successes. So, uh, even before specializing in psychedelics, I have been interested in uh, psychoactive substances in general in what effect they can have on our lives, on their benefits and also harms, uh, especially addictions. And I wrote my bachelor thesis about value orientations of users of various psychoactive substances and uh, comparing them with non-users. First attempt to defend this thesis was a failure. Although I got excellent review of my supervisor and uh, opponent of the thesis, decision of the committee was that I haven't passed. I felt that it was very unfair and asked the head of the department to tell me his opinion. And when I came to see him, he already read the thesis because this kind of situation was uh, pretty exceptional in the history of the, of the faculty. And he told me that he would give me B, which is almost the best evaluation, but he cannot do anything if another committee had different opinion. And so I had to wait for 
next attempt. My academic career in psychedelics uh, started, I think, around five years ago when I learned about the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. And I realized that psychedelics is something that can be researched and studied and that my theory that using psychoactive substances we know uh, usually from the parties doesn't need to be necessarily bad, was true. And soon after, I had to choose the topic of my master thesis. And in spite of my previous uh, experience, I decided to study, study psychoactive substances again. This time, ayahuasca in the treatment of addictions. I have learned about the Sensor Takivasi, which lies in, uh, in Tarapoto, in Peru, uh, which was a pretty breaking point for my, for my career. Um, it took one year to get there. I had to learn Spanish meanwhile, uh, then, uh, and then I came there as a volunteer and also researcher to, to get the data for my thesis. And when I came back enthusiastic about what I learned and how unique research I did at the university, the, the enthusiasm was uh, much uh, smaller. And instead of defending my thesis, I had to interrupt my studies for one year because one professor gave, uh, didn't give me enough points uh, for the, some small regular seminar works that, uh, which I needed to pass the subject. Because I was missing a few lectures because of my internship in, in Peru, in Takivasi. I remember being uh, for a few weeks in pretty serious depression, not leaving house at all, crying uh, and feeling ununderstood and refused by the society. And I couldn't understand why my topic is, uh, is more than, uh, than topics of other people, than other topics. What helped to recover uh, was Czech Psychedelic Society. When I came back from Takivasi, the clear, I came back with the clear intention uh, to found uh, this kind of society in Czech Republic. So immediately I started to look uh, for the like-minded people. I got them together and uh, started all the work and we did. One of the intentions for me was to show to my professor that studying psychology doesn't mean that I am just a crazy junkie, but that it can be serious subjects studied at the prestigious universities. And very motivating for me was when I organized a lecture with uh, Robert Carhart Harris and around 1,000 people came for this talk. And I also visited National Institute of Mental Health to, to know the only people in Czech Republic who work with the psychedelics in Czech Republic. So mainly Tomáš, uh, Dr. Tomáš Pálenicek, head of the psilocybin research team, and Petr Pinklar, head of uh, social psychiatry reform in Czech Republic. I was bachelor with interrupted studies with almost no previous work experience except being waitress and with huge interest in psychedelics, which was pretty much contraindication to get any other job. But it was at the same time this interest through which I was offered a job as a researcher at an institution in the psilocybin program. So it was like my dreams came true. And so it was pretty corrective experience for me and also for my parents. Today, it is uh, three years I worked there studying psychedelics on different levels. Uh, I'm interested in research in, uh, in 60s, uh, in uh, psilocybin, uh, currently also in, uh, in the effect of buffo alvario secretion. I successfully uh, defended my ayahuasca thesis a few years ago presented, uh, and presented the results on uh, many Czech and international conferences. After many successful events and progress we did with the Czech Psychedelic Society, I decided to move further and put together another team to organize the global multidisciplinary conference in Prague, the title Beyond Psychedelics. I think it was pretty successful. Uh, even we had no experience in organizing uh, this kind of congress. And, uh, and that's also the reason why uh, we organized the next volume this year. So all of you are invited to, to come to Prague uh, from 21st to 24th June. You can also meet Ben Sessa there in person, uh, besides uh, many other leading experts in, uh, in psychedelics. And so today I do many things in various areas, but most of them are connected with psychedelics, which I'm happy for. I'm a researcher, I'm a PhD student, activist, I'm helping people to process their psychedelic experiences, psychologist, I'm public speaker, conference organizer, and all about psychedelics. And so deciding to build a career in psychedelics was not the easiest thing to do. 
It took much longer, cost me much more energy. I had to overcome many obstructions, which I could easily avoid if I would just uh, choose different topic. But what I want to emphasize is that most of the time I was happy to do it. And I'm grateful for all the experience I received and I don't regret at all. Because still, for me, it was much easier to study something I believe in, would make sense to me, I'm interested in, even it was the hard way. When I think about all those people which could be helped by psychedelics, and also those who were caused harm by, by psychedelics, and, uh, or just don't receive the benefits which they, they could, it is my driving force just to keep up with the work. And now I think I can say that it was worth it because although I'm just uh, 30 years old and my career started around uh, four years ago, today I can be considered one of the top experts on psychedelics in Czech Republic, which sounds pretty funny for me. And I would not imagine something like this to happen a few years ago, especially when I was the ruined bachelor student, which was thinking that this life is just not worth living. And so I hope that my story can inspire someone. And uh, I would like to support you in not, uh, not having fear, although it can sometimes feel desperate. There is also huge support. And maybe it can be difficult in the beginning uh, or in your, in your local community, in your city or in your country. There is a huge support in, uh, outside in the global psychedelic community. And so take a decision you consider to be right be active be patient be persistent and mainly trust yourself and not forget that you are not alone and i believe it will be highly rewarded because there are also no other conferences like uh, those uh, focused on psychedelics and in line with what ben mentioned i would like to support especially women to to get involved because I believe that it is not healthy for our society, for anyone, if also this era is, uh, is still predominantly masculine. And if you are not sure about what to do it, I would like to invite you to, to contact me and, uh, and I'm happy to, to try to help, uh, help away, to support you, to, to, to get involved, because we need you. And yeah, so thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Rita. Um, I'm already inspired by your story. It sounds like you've made an amazing amount of progress in the last three years alone. So I look forward to getting more of your perspective and your experiences and how we can make that happen abroad. Thank so you. let's go on to uh, Anne now. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit about uh, your experience researching uh, with MDMA and um, you know a little bit about yourself and your work. Great, thanks, Dan. And thanks to the panelists before us and Toronto Psychedelic. Toronto Psychedelic Society. So uh, I'm Dr. Ann Wagner. I'm a clinical psychologist in Toronto. And so I am both a therapist and a researcher. And I kind of landed in this world of psychedelics and MDMA assisted psychotherapy from a super traditional route, actually. I, if you'd asked me five years ago about MDMA or psychedelics, I don't think I could have told you anything at all. So it's been a uh, quick road and a very intense one for me, and it's been very rewarding so far. So uh, as a background, so I am a post-traumatic stress disorder treatment development researcher. That's kind of my main area. And I've been working with Dr. Candace Monson uh, on a type of treatment called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy for PTSD. So it's a couple's treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. And we've been working on that um, I've been working on that with her for about 10 years. So from the beginning of my graduate training up until now, and Candace developed this treatment with her colleague, Stephanie Fredman, um, about, about 18 years ago, I'd say. So it's been going through testing and we see, you know, great results actually with it uh, when we don't use MDMA. So, um, you know, how Ben was saying initially that there's, you know, about 50% of people don't, um, you know, the treatments we have don't work for them for PTSD. When we, when we do CBCT, it's up to 60% of people it does work for. So, I mean, it can be, it's still, you know, in the margin of, um, there's a lot of people who could still have benefit beyond there. 
And the interesting thing is when we do this type of treatment, we're treating not only the person with PTSD, we're treating their loved one as well, and we're treating the relationship. So we've been testing that out. And then about four years ago, we were approached, Candace and I were approached by uh, Rick Doblin and Michael Mithofer from the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and the suggestion of collaborating on um, potentially doing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy with CBCT. And the idea with, for that was because up until then, all of the MDMA-assisted psychotherapies for PTSD that have been tested have been with non-directive supportive psychotherapies. So meaning that it's um, the therapist's best skill set and whatever their background is, but there's no particular um, treatment that would be a standalone that would be used to treat PTSD without the MDMA that's used. So the idea was theoretically, okay, so if we've got something that is considered one of our current best standards of treatment for PTSD, and if we combine that with MDMA, what would happen? And we were particularly interested because of MDMA's properties as, you know, an empathogen, an intactogen, the idea that it can really um, impact your empathy towards someone else, that for a couple's treatment, that could be particularly effective. And so we've been working on that uh, study from writing the protocol all the way through to we just finished the pilot, uh, which is very exciting. And we're in the process of looking at our results. I just actually had a, a follow up session this morning with one of the couples that we were uh, seeing through the study. And yeah, our results are so strong that we actually decided to stop after six couples and move on to a larger study. So um, the idea being of trying to add some, a new and different theory around uh, the use of MDMA within psychotherapies, including what we know about the treatments that we are using that do work for some folks and don't work for others. So um, it's been a real um, journey for me as both a therapist, a researcher, and also individually, because um, as Ben was mentioning in his talk, there, you know, I've had the opportunity to be a healthy participant in an MDMA assisted psychotherapy uh, study for therapists. And that was really what convinced me of MD MDMA's potential use for PTSD treatment. So that kind of seminal experience for me about four years ago now to today when we've just finished our first pilot and are about to, I'm about to start writing the protocol for our next one. So we're going to be using cognitive processing therapy plus MDMA, as well as uh, going forward with a larger randomized control trial of the couple's treatment. So I'm really uh, excited about uh, the work that we're doing and uh, want to put a shout out out there to people who are trying to get their way through their clinical training or want to be therapists and do this work. Um, it might feel like it's a long road to get there to be able to, for example, sit with someone in a um, psychedelic session one day, but you can get there. So I know I get a lot of questions from uh, up and coming folks in their, you know, in their undergrads and their masters and their PhDs who want to be doing this work. And I think one of the best pieces of advice I can give is develop your skills. So develop your skills in whatever area it is that, where you want to um, really use your best skills. So if you're going to be a therapist, develop your best therapy skills. If you're going to be an advocate, develop your, your best advocacy skills. If you're going to be a lawyer helping us out, develop your best lawyer skills, right? So I think having a strong skill set will take you far if you're wanting to enter this world um, of psychedelics. So I think that's it for me. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, I have a bunch of questions that I'm looking forward to asking you about these different modalities of therapy that you're using and what else might be useful in the future. Um, and yes, diversity of tactics, definitely also good to emphasize. There's a lot of work left to be done. Uh, Trevor, how would you come on now and give us a little bit about your experience and um, your history with Liberty Therapy and uh, the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance? Absolutely. Thank you. Put these back in. Hey, thanks to everybody that's come before me and thanks for putting this on. My name's Trevor Miller. I'm in Vancouver, BC. I own a company called Liberty Root Therapy Limited 
And Liberty Root was founded, it was founded out of a desire I had that started around 2001. After 9-11, I was very frustrated with the state of the world. I realized the media was driving me crazy, so I unplugged from the media and at the same time decided to try and do something to help the world. So I looked at a neighborhood that we've got here in Vancouver called the Downtown East Side, and it looked like it needed some help. So rightly or wrongly, I started digging in on looking at different ways that I might be able to help that. And I did that kind of, I had no right to do that. I had no schooling. I had no, uh, you know, background in social work. I, I barely even liked the idea of social work, but I had a, a philosophy that uh, based on a lot of, re of reading that I had done on how to be a better person, it seemed to me that kind of the happiest people and the people that I most wanted to emulate on earth seemed to be helping a heck of a lot more people than I was. So I looked at the downtown east side and that really turned into almost a 10 year research project. At a certain point around 2005, I started a company selling t-shirts and I was gonna use the profits of those t-shirts to help the downtown east side. But at the same time, I had no idea what I was gonna do with that money, even if I did make it. So I, in that 10 years, I made a lot of contacts. I did a lot of networking. I became close with the people who run the Vancouver area network of drug users, Vandu. And at a certain point, I ran out of, I, I actually took six months. I, I spent a couple of months and moved right into the downtown east side, right at the corner of Hastings and Maine, and uh, went into debt doing that, needed a job. So I went and worked on cruise ships. I realized if I wanted to make the kind of impact that I wanted to make in the world, I was going to have to become a better public speaker. So I worked in the entertainment department on cruise ships, became a cruise director, met my wife, now ex-wife, still best friend, got married, moved back to Vancouver in 2009 and started looking in the downtown east side again. And even while I was away, I was still on cruise ships, thinking of the downtown east side and different angles that might be able to help down there. So I met with Ann Livingston when I got back and uh, had, a, had a day job that could kind of float my boat and started looking at ways to help that neighborhood again. Met with Ann Livingston, who was the person who founded the Vancouver Area ne Network of Drug Users and said, look, I'm looking at different ways that I might be able to help down here. She was you know, very gracious and we spent a few hours chatting, thinking about different ways I might be able to do that. And the whole time I was speaking to her, there was a binder on the wall behind her that said Ibogaine on it. And I said, what about Ibogaine? And she said, actually, I have people that are calling me for that all the time. So I, I was very familiar with the psychedelic world. In high school, I started doing LSD. I think I was 14 years old. Um, I saw the therapeutic benefit of that substance even though I wouldn't have called it a therapy, I wouldn't have known it was therapeutic at the time. I just remember very specifically saying to my friends during one trip saying, this is what adults forget that has made the world so screwed up. So I kind of got the therapeutic benefit of psychedelics then. But um, then around this time in 2001, when I started looking at the downtown east side, I also ended up being the roommate of the woman that owned the shop called the Urban Shaman here in Vancouver. So I was surrounded by that psychedelic community then. So I had heard about Iboga and Ibogaine, but I had never really put two and two together on that being a solution for the downtown east side. But uh, Ann Livingston said, you know, why don't you chase that? I agreed. Let's, let's, look, at, let's look at that as an angle. And basically a few years passed without too much happening. I gave Ibogaine to people, a couple people, and I realized very quickly that I didn't know what I was doing. So I stopped doing that, but Anne kept forwarding uh, phone calls to me. And eventually the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance, or GIDA, they had their annual conference here in Vancouver. And Anne called me and said, uh, did you know there's an Ibogaine conference in town? I didn't. She said, well, I put your name on the list as a provider. You should go down. So I spent the next four or five days with people who really did know what they were doing with Ibogaine. I met the person who became my business partner. And a few months later, we the phone rang. They, it was a 
a family looking for ibogaine treatment. He, my business partner, had apprenticed with people in Mexico on how to give that medicine properly. So we decided to treat this family. It went very well and we kind of looked at each other, saw that there was a big need for this in Vancouver and decided to open what became Liberty Root. So we rented a three bedroom townhome in White Rock, just out of the one of the suburbs here in Vancouver. And we treated about 75 people in two years through that townhouse and then graduated to a bigger place. We had a three bedroom, 6,500 square foot mansion in White Rock as well and treated another 75 or so people through there. Um, really wonderful synchronicities happened through this whole process. The right doors opened. Um, I met Mark Hayden, who's the head of Maps Canada. He was a very big supporter originally. And Livingston, as I mentioned, we had a lot of great doctors and nurses who came on board. Ibogaine is a potentially dangerous medicine. We do a lot of screening before a client would come in and see us. And uh, Gabor Mate has become a very good friend and a very big supporter of us as well. We're actually going to be doing Iboga together at the end of the month. So that should be interesting. And um, the downtown east side was really where this all started. So while we did take paying clients in for our 10 day program, we also did what we could to give back to the downtown east side. So I worked with Van Du. Um, we did our pilot program was essentially meeting. We, everybody had to meet once a week for about three months leading into the I began uh, process if, if the person did qualify at the end. So after that first three month process, we started with about 15 people. Then it was about five people that were showing up on a daily basis. And in the end, we had one guy who was still ready and willing and we treated him He's uh, still, a, he's a very good friend of mine. He is now, I think, at least a couple of years clean. He has a job, he has an apartment, and he called me the other day and says he's got $5,000 that he wants to invest in a cryptocurrency project. That's something else that I'm focused on for the last year. I've been heavily involved in cryptocurrencies, and I'm on the executive team of a gold-backed cryptocurrency that has a huge charitable component. So we're really hoping to dump a bunch of money into this downtown east side program specifically um, yeah so that's it in a nutshell and you know just as far as as far as kind of advice to people that want to work with medicines like this I would just say one of the most important things is work on yourself put yourself under the hood as much as possible give yourself these therapies and really Make sure that you have a really excellent foundation of integrity from which to build this career on because you're dealing with, uh, you're playing with fire. These medicines are very, very powerful. And if you don't have integrity in what you're doing, it's eventually going to come out. So that would be one bit of advice is really do the work on yourself. Amazing. Thanks so much, Trevor. Uh, I think your story is a good indication that the paths to working in the psychedelic renaissance are many. And um, thank you as well for that responsible voice. Um, you know, the boundary between inner work and outer work, I think, especially in psychotherapy and such um, disciplines and places of study is very, very thin a lot of time. So I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but why don't we move on to our last panelist, uh, Allison. Uh, how about you tell us a little bit about your work in cannabis and perhaps a little bit about what you think the psychedelic movement can learn from the cannabis movement. You bet. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, it's been great to hear everybody else's stories. So uh, my background has been as a human resources professional and uh, an entrepreneur. And in the summer of 2015, my husband and I both started to see and hear a lot more in the news about cannabis legalization. And at that point, it was a lot of what was happening in the U.S. at the state level. Uh, and that was pre-Trudeau government in Canada. So um, the, the federal government we have in place right now was elected in the fall of 2015. And they one of their platforms that they ran on was to regulate uh, and legalize cannabis so 
cannabis was something that I had a recreational relationship with when I was younger. Uh, and then I would say that I kind of grew out of it for, for lack of a better word. So it was really fascinating to me now, you know, uh, you know, to David's comments earlier, something that we were told was, was so bad and so wrong, uh, was now going to be legalized and, and there was some obvious kind of business opportunities around it. So, um, that seemed like a bit of a, a contradiction, but was also really r very interesting. So I had an interest in participating in the sector in some way. At first, I didn't know exactly what that would mean. Uh, and then I, I realized eventually, it, it should have been more obvious perhaps, but then I, I realized that I'm a human resources professional, I'm an entrepreneur, and there's a, a big human resources kind of challenge on one side when we're talking about workplace impairment with cannabis legalization, but then also uh, an opportunity around helping other organizations to recruit staff uh, into this growing sector. Um, so once I got past my own concerns of the career suicide uh, conversation that came up earlier, uh, I you know, decided that I was going to you know, just start to work on articles, products, services, and, and put them out and, and see what happened. Uh, and there's been a ton of momentum behind it ever since. So uh, 2015, our initial service offering was largely education for employers about cannabis legalization and what that meant in terms of managing um, employees that may have a medical authorization or prescription for cannabis uh, or what that meant as we move forward with recreational legalization and what needed to happen in terms of workplace drug and alcohol policies and procedures uh, to you know, manage the safety side of the workplace and productivity side of the workplace um, as this moves forward. Uh, and then in April of 2017, so April of last year, the uh, bill for our recreational cannabis legalization, Bill C-45, was tabled, uh, and that's been moving um, through, through various readings and through the system, uh, and the idea, the, the hope is that it's going to be uh, implemented this summer. Uh, initially, we were talking about July of this year, and it looks like it's going to be more like August of this year that our recreational legalization will be implemented. So once we had an announcement uh, and that bill tabled, we really saw the the regulated cannabis sector in Canada start to ramp up towards what, what recreational legalization was going to mean. And so we've seen a lot of growth um, within the sector. So in Canada, we have... Health Canada approved producers of cannabis. They're called licensed producers. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes, but mostly these are very, very large pharmaceutical grade uh, facilities that are producing cannabis into our medical market right now. And in Canada right now, we have uh, over 200,000 people that have a medical authorization uh, for cannabis. And these licensed producers will be the same uh, producers and suppliers of cannabis into the recreational market as well. Um, so from a, a staffing perspective, uh, we saw an opportunity and we launched our recruitment and staffing division uh, last spring. So with that, we recruit for licensed producers in Canada. We recruit for uh, some of the ancillary businesses that exist uh, around that regulated sector. Uh, and as we approach our, our retail model as legalization uh, moves forward. We also do recruitment on the retail side. So currently we have a contract with the Ontario Cannabis Retail Corporation uh, to do recruitment for their stores and uh, we'll be looking at some of the other provinces in terms of those opportunities as well. So um, I'm happy to talk about some of, I, I maybe won't go into this detail right now, but happy to talk about some of the areas where we see transferable skill sets into this sector. Um, you know, and I think when I, when I look at this compared to uh, the, the psychedelic uh, society and, and those opportunities, I mean, I think where I, I see some parallels is just, this is a substance that um, we're kind of behind on the research in terms of, of the medical uh, power of this plant, but there's such obvious um, power there. Um, and as we, we continue to uh, work with this plant, um, do more research. I think that you know we're going to have some really amazing uh, medical outcomes that come out of that. So I'll leave that uh, there for now, and happy to participate in the Q and A. Great, thank you so much, Allison. Um, I think actually the first question that comes to me um, when listening to you speak is this model of having uh, a medical license for people for individual use of cannabis that can take it home and 
uh, use it themselves. Do you think that that is something that could perhaps apply to psychedelics? And then maybe uh, the others could chime in on whether or not that's something we would want to be doing, or if it's more ideal to have people on hand to support you through that. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that some of the other psychedelics we're talking about um, are in, in certain ways far more I guess, powerful than uh, cannabis. And so there, there may be other risks um, that I'll let the other panelists speak about from, from that perspective. Um, you know, I, I think even with cannabis, that's one of the challenges. I mean, we see the medical community uh, evolving, you know, quite quickly about, around cannabis, but there's a lot of physicians who are not experienced uh, with prescribing cannabis. And there seems to be uh, a willingness to have this kind of try it out and see approach because cannabis is, is non-toxic and there's no reported fatal overdoses. Um, but, you know, I, I think what I'm really excited about is, is a future where we do have more science that can say, you know, this particular strain uh, will, has been shown to help with this particular you know, symptom and that we can, you know, we can eliminate some of that time that a patient might spend on their own trying to find the appropriate, you know, strain um, or quantity, whatever their, you know, their overall dosing regime opposed to, uh, or, and then have somebody be able to direct that um, so they can get to the out outcome that they're after a bit quicker. Uh, great. Thank you for your uh, thoughts on that. Um, yes, it would be uh, good if we did have that data. Definitely. We do need to catch up on that. Uh, did anybody else have anything based on their experiences uh, that they'd like to throw in for that question? Um, yeah, Anne, go ahead. I, okay, there we go. Um, I think particularly, so when we're using MDMA as, an, as part of a therapy, I think the context of using it in a really particular set and setting and context with a therapist or with a sitter is so very important. So... Um, because of that, we, you know, we do, just as Ben described, we do two MDMA sessions and they are like big therapeutic sessions. And so I think the context of having that in a very controlled setting is so important and actually lends a lot to the therapeutic use of it. So I would be, especially in the use of MDMA as a therapy tool, I um, am a firm believer in doing it in a setting with a therapist or with a sitter. So as opposed to like a take home um, experience. Right. And do you think then that there are other legitimate uses if we were to have some sort of framework like that? Because um, there's an interesting thing uh, I read a while ago in uh, Terence McKenna's Plan Plant Planet essay. He talks about uh, psychedelics being sort of an anti addiction drug. So it would actually be beneficial to sort of have them being generally used even outside of therapeutic contexts and perhaps mitigating the negative effects of uh, people's developed attention dependencies on alcohol and uh, things like that. So is there any way in which you could see a framework of um, authorization for personal use being something that we could look forward to? I think um, I can speak only mostly to the context of MDMA, but I think in that context, it's going to be a very long time until that's um, possible. However, I think really it's the intentionality of the use and the and the way in which it's done. So set setting context, I think that can be created in other places as opposed to within a therapy office. But it's just it's the intention behind it. I think that's really important. And the, the kind of the uh, the word that sacredness is coming to mind, but that's not actually what I mean. The um, the way in which that's held, the container in which that space is held, and for the purpose by which it's being used. So I think it's a, it's a real thoughtfulness around it. Right, and perhaps respect for the compound. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, is there anybody else that wants to chime in on that before we... Uh, sure, I will. Yeah, well, me too. Yeah. You go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, you know, I'm not a big fan of prohibition overall, and I don't like... Uh, you know, the regulation of certain substances is not proven very effective at all. And at the same time, I think it is very important what Anne said to have that set and setting thought out and worked through. And, you know, it's a very different thing to take mushrooms around a campfire with a bunch of beers or to take psilocybin with a blindfold on, with headphones on and go deep into yourself that way. Um, I also feel as though a lot of people need access to this medicine. I feel our, our world is very sick. And if we can get people to take psychedelic psychotherapy seriously, 
I think that would be a real benefit. Something that I've spoken to Mark Hayden about is the concept of doing something like almost like a midwife where it doesn't necessarily need to be a professional in a professional setting for, um, for, you know, if for more serious traumas, absolutely. That's the way to go. But for kind of a, an everyday person that needs this anyway, just maybe to lift some depression or I, I worked with somebody on their anxiety recently with a different a, a space to talk about the intersections of mental illnesses and the and psychedelic use and Oh, did anyone else hear that? Anyway, um, ultimately, I think that I, that concept of almost like a midwife, where let's have people that are knowledgeable in how to provide these sessions and make it available to as many people as possible. There's a book called The Secret Chief or The Secret Chief Revealed that MAPS puts out. It's about a underground psychedelic psychotherapist who gave this medicine to over 3,000 people, gave mostly LSD and other substances to over 3,000 people. But he outlines in that book very clearly how to give a very safe psychic. There it is right there, Leo. So it's, you know, if somebody wants to know how do I give a, a therapeutic psychedelic session to somebody, that book outlines it so beautifully. And it's, it's a very powerful protocol. So I just think we need to get this medicine to people if we're going to wait for everybody to get specifically licensed to do this. I'm just scared that it's not going to happen quick enough. Right. Yeah, I definitely think that that's an important thing to account for. Like, what is the speed at which this is going to be happening? Especially if we do show that these can have massive effects on uh, transforming individuals, and then, you know, everyone's only two or three steps away from being in contact with the rest of the culture themselves. Uh, so it seems like you do advocate some sort of hierarchical structure of degrees of uh, training and certification that we could yeah, to sort of make this available to people quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I come in on that as well? Yes, please. Um, just going back to your question, you know, do we do we see the day when when this is expanded beyond the clinical setting? Um, absolutely. Um, I think all of us in the field recognise that uh, these substances are too good to only stay within the clinical population. Um, indeed, Albert himself said shortly before his death, um, when the when the next psychedelic renaissance comes, the doctors must not be allowed to run the show. Um, it was an acceptance that simply um, uh, restricting these to the clinical population is just not good enough. I think we all can envisage the situation whereby there will be community-based psychedelic treatment centers where people can come from all walks of life, whether they have clinical issues or not, to use psychedelics in a facilitative setting for personal growth and development, for families, for um, communities, which would be holistic centers where psychedelic use is not the only thing that's going on. They would also be doing yoga and Pilates and um, learning about lifestyle changes and using the psychedelic experience as a springboard for whole holistic lifestyle change. And so I think that's a really important part of it. On the other hand, I hear what Anne says and I agree completely. If you, at the moment that seems like, it feels like quite a long way off. And it sort of makes sense that we would be targeting the clinical populations first because we're more likely to get regulatory approvals for that before we get it outside of that. But I think we have to keep pushing ahead with the whole agenda um, because these are too good to be kept under lock and key and too useful. And I, I, the hope is that as we've seen with cannabis medicine, once the medical st professions start accepting it, we then start seeing recreational use following in its wake. Um, and it's informed, set and setting, evidence-based recreational use. And I think that's what's really um, exciting about the move forward with cannabis, but also I can't see why that won't happen with other psychedelics if they demonstrate the safety and efficacy that we in the field believe they have. Great, thank you for that perspective. Um, that is a day that I await for these holistic centers. Uh, perhaps institutions that could provide some sort of wisdom to our culture, which is drastically needed, I think, at this time. Mm -hmm.
Now, I'm interested in uh, the perspective of the clinicians here. Um, you know, we're at the University of Toronto, and we have a lot of clinicians and researchers who are really looking to uh, get on board with this movement. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit about the experiences overcoming legal hurdles uh, that make this sort of research so difficult. Um, you know, how does the license application process go, and um, what can we expect for writing ethics approvals, grants, and that kind of thing? Um, I don't know, Ben, did you want to start with that? Yeah, I mean, I get asked this a lot, you know, does the government block this research because it's controversial? No, they don't. Not in my experience. The only, the major impediment to psychedelic research is money. That's what's blocking research. If you look at the pharma industry, you know, 99% of human pharmacological research is funded by the pharma industry because they have a product to sell. So they, can, they think nothing of throwing 20 million at this chemical, 20 million at that chemical, because if one of them sticks and turns out to be the next Prozac or the next um, Viagra, then they'll make trillions. So they have all this cash to throw at these obscure chemicals. Now, all of psychedelic research has taken place outside of the pharma industry. Look at the work that Rick has done at MAPS, just beg, borrowing and stealing to gather together these millions to bring this drug to market. It's staggeringly expensive pharmacological research. And so that is the barrier. Once you have a backer and somebody with very deep pockets, you're gonna, you'll cruise through the, through the regulatory parts. I mean, sure, they're expensive and they take time. And you know, when you're working with what's a schedule one drug in the UK, you need home office approval. And this requires you to have a license at all the sites where the drug goes or passes through. Um, it takes time, it takes months, it takes thousands of pounds here, there and everywhere. But if it's a well-designed study with good safety parameters, ethics approval, it, 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 I mean, for us, at least, our MDMA study, that was the, by far the easiest bit. The ethics thing, it cruised right through because they're, they're usually people who look at the risks and benefits. And, and as long as you've designed a good study, that's not the difficult bit. Um, sure, there are extra time and money restraints associated with the fact that they're scheduled, but the main thing is having lots and lots of money. Once you've got that, your study is going to happen. Right, so money is the main obstacle at the moment, it seems. Um, and, you know, for... Or actually, I was wondering uh, if you could give us some insight as well into the costs of getting that uh, study that you're doing now put through. Um, are you able to disclose any of that information so we know what to look forward to when we're doing this? Uh, our, our, our Bristol MDMA study for alcoholism? Um, yeah. yeah, well, um, we are about, we're, we're about 18 months behind schedule. And the biggest problem with that is that we've got a team of people who are salaried, myself included, who we keep we keep saying it's going to start in three weeks. It's going to start in three weeks. And we've been saying that for about 18 months now. We keep shifting the goalposts. So we've just been hemorrhaging all of this salaried money. If we'd known, you know, a year ago, nothing's going to happen for the next 12 months, we would have all sort of dropped out and gone and done other jobs, jobs and saved money on the budget. But because it's almost about to happen constantly, it's Kafkaesque. We've been losing all this cash. So we we estimated about six hundred thousand pounds to do the study we're all we've already spent that and we are about to start in about three weeks so um I, I, you need a good a good six hundred to eight hundred thousand pounds i think in our experience but that's partly because because ours was a flagship study in the uk with mdma clinical mdma and the first one we've done a lot of the work so now MAPS has a vast amount of MDMA, about 1.9 kilograms of GMP MDMA in the UK, which um, they're happy to distribute around the world. So that, that big barrier or hurdle has been crossed. But you are looking at half a million pounds, I think, for a decent sized uh, phase two um, unique study. Um, so the, the money is, is, is quite staggering. Um, does that answer the question? Uh, yes, yes, uh, definitely gives me a better idea of what to look forward to in trying to get research funding into this sort of thing. And, um, and like I said, we have a very, um, we have a, a very supportive and very flexible funder who has bailed us out once with an extra cash boost to give us another 12 months. So we should be, we, we're fully funded up to 2019, uh, August 2019. And so we're not going to get the whole 20 patients we would like to, but we're going to get as many as we can in between now and then. Right. 
And are you aware offhand of any research grants that uh, would be sympathetic to this kind of research that people might be able to seek out? Um, well, I think you just have to look around at what's going on locally and you've got to be, you've got to be shrewd as well. I mean, we approached um, all of the various uh, vet organizations in the UK, but we didn't get any support from any of them when we were designing our first MDMA study. They all said, oh, it sounds like a fabulous idea, but it's a bit of a reputational risk for us. My, my sense is that, that as soon as these start becoming more accepted, then people are going to be queuing up to fund this research because there's a lot of funders waiting in the wings who would like to get involved, but they're a little bit cautious. But as soon as it starts becoming more mainstream, they're going to come pouring in a bit like the whole kind of green dollar thing in the States with, with cannabis. Um, there's a lot of money out there that people would like to put into this, but they're being very shy. I mean, when it comes to making money, Rick Doblin is the person to speak to because he seems to be able to extract every last dollar from everyone he meets. So he's, uh, he's, very, he's very good at the whole fundraising part of it, which is essential. Because like I say, we are, if MDMA gets its license in 2021, this will be only the second time in pharmacology's history that a drug has been brought to market by a charitable organization. The other example was um, the a charitable organization that brought the morning after pill to market. That was done outside of the pharma industry. Um, but all other pharmacology research comes from pharma. Um, so it will be a tremendous accolade if we get MDMA out in this way. Fantastic. And it sounds like things are only getting easier. So that is definitely good for all of the people here interested in jumping on that uh, domain of research. Yeah. Is there anything else that wants to comment on that? Maybe Anne or Rita, uh, regarding your experiences? I, I can go ahead if you want. Um, so I would say, as Ben indicated, so we're funded by MAPS. So I've had the benefit of uh, Rick's ability to shake down trees in terms of getting money. Um, and also, we really benefited from the fact that uh, MDMA research had already been approved um, for, for our site with our collaborators. So we work with Annie and Michael Mithofer in South Carolina. So our pilot study, they'd already gone through the processes for approvals in South Carolina previously. Um, and so that we already kind of knew what we'd be getting into. And then, so we... Like Ben was saying, for us, getting approval, like ethics approval, was not the hurdle. That was actually very smooth. It was like any any other pharma or psychological intervention study. You just, you know, you write your ethics and you do it well and you answer the questions and you make sure all your safety measures are in place. Um, and Health Canada didn't have to approve our pilot study because we, were, we did it in South Carolina. They will have to approve uh, the next one that's going to take place in Toronto. And luckily, we've got phase two, study, or phase two and three studies on the large psychopharmacological studies of MDMA for PTSD that have happened in Vancouver and are potentially happening in Montreal. So we've also had people pave the way. Um, because that paving of the way has been done and we're still using MDMA that has been, was created for the earlier studies, the earlier MDMA studies, we didn't have to pay for the development of that. So our funds were a lot less. Also as researchers who are on other projects, we didn't have our, all of our salary or not, or well, chunks of our salary covered. So our costs were a lot less than um, what happened for Ben's study. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it varies, I think. It, I mean, it's not cheap, to, I'll emphasize not cheap, to do intervention studies at all, um, but it's also not prohibitively expensive from what we've done so far. So, Right, so it's still compared with other um, areas of research then. Yeah. In terms of uh, Czech Republic, uh, so yeah, we, I think we, we shared the, the same opinion that the because the obstruction is uh, basically money. Uh, like the study, the ongoing psilocybin study, we, uh, where we are giving psilocybin to healthy volunteers, uh, the cost was around uh, 350 US dollars. Uh, the interesting uh, fact is that uh, this study is actually supported uh, by the governmental funds. 
Uh, so not uh, by private sponsors, which uh, I think is pretty unique in uh, in the psychedelic uh, research. Uh, but uh, yeah, now we have uh, another projects like uh, like psilocybin, the clinical trial on psilocybin for depression. Uh, we need uh, one million, one and a half million uh, dollars, but uh, but uh, we simply don't uh, have those money. So so. Yeah, that's the that's the main thing. At the same time, I think that it's not uh, also just uh, about money because uh, mm, we ask again the government uh, for governmental grant for this uh, study, uh, but it was refused, and uh, and there was this uh, mm, imbalance in the evaluation from the from the people from abroad and from the people from uh, from Czech Republic. And I also like uh, have this uh, experience that uh, when I uh, was uh, um, applying for my PhD on uh, on the medical faculty uh, with the project uh, to to which was designed to to get the data on this ongoing psilocybin study, which was already approved, and uh, and we have already measured the first twenty volunteers. So uh, I was not accepted, uh, and the reason was that they don't consider this to be ethical, and they think we should not study this. And so my argument, like, uh, yeah, but it's already approved, like, it, and we are already giving it to the people. So the only difference is if we will take a look on what the, was the effect of the psilocybin or not. And uh, yeah, so so right after that, uh, we just uh, I just we just put on the list the, the people who 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 were responsible for this refusal and uh, ask uh, for for those people not to evaluate any of the other uh, future psychedelic projects. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it was a bit of an ethical pushback, but uh, it seems mostly money. Um, so I guess the takeaway is if you want careers to open up as fast as possible, we should all just donate money to uh, these research endeavors to make them happen. Um, and so one other question uh, that I think might be relevant as well on this topic um, for Allison, as a PR specialist, um, how do we sort of like sell psychedelics to the public? What is a good way of framing this issue that we can uh, you know, work to getting that funding that we need? Um, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, somewhat to Ben's comment earlier, when, when we can start from that medical perspective and have some success there and it creates standards, uh, you know, around medical applications, I think that that does help then to, to shift to, uh, the more, I guess, recreational um, element or the more mainstream aspect. So when we can, you know, get a, uh, a stronghold of the population um, utilizing, for example, in my case, you know, cannabis, um, we're able to get a bit of a, a groundswell around acceptance for that. People can see that there are very positive outcomes um, to using cannabis and that some of the concerns that we've been told for years um, about the war on drugs, some of the, again, in the case of cannabis, some of the reefer madness type of uh, paranoia, um, it, you know, it's, it's actually not uh, playing out that way. Like if, you know, if we look at it somewhere like Colorado that's now had medical and recreational sales for a period of time, you know, the sky has not fallen. Uh, and that place is not, you know, turned upside down and, and been taken over by criminals and, and drug lords. So I think that when we can approach it from that medical perspective first, it can create that foundation, um, to create some of that acceptance that we can then uh, cross the chasm and uh, shift to the more mainstream population. Great. Thank you so much for your input on that. Um, so I'm interested, uh, now we've got funding and those sorts of issues out of the way. Um, for our researchers, uh, what sort of uh, research assistant or laboratory positions are available and what sorts of skills would you find valuable in your labs uh, for people who are going to be applying for uh, a foot into the psychedelic research? And I don't know, um, Anne or Ben, would you like to address that question first? Sure. Um, okay, so I get asked this question uh, a fair amount. Um, so I would say, you know, for example, so right now, to answer the question of anyone in Toronto, I do not have any positions open. However, mm -hmm. if you're interested, you can email me and I'll put your name on a list. So, um, but the, the meaning is that eventually I will need people and all psychedelic research studies need folks who are good research assistants, meaning are you organized? Are you um, dedicated? Can you run a literature search? Can you help me 
make sure that people are getting called on time? Can you call people? Do you have good, you know, interpersonal skills and potentially even some clinical skills in doing intakes, right? So it's, it's basic um, project management and some with some particular skills that are uh, related to psychology, psychiatry, uh, therapeutic research. So there's that type of skill set. Um, and then also it tends to be in different uh, different studies. So for example, there are roles that like night attendants that um, would stay with folks. For example, we have um, for our MDMA study in South Carolina, we all, all of our participants stay overnight. So we don't, as the therapist, I don't stay overnight and back the next morning, but we have someone who comes in who maybe has bachelor's degree in psychology is interested in pursuing more interested in the work and they might stay overnight as a night attendant so that kind of gives you an intro into what this might look like what it might be like interacting with a participant or not um, so that type of role it would also be kind of a casual but uh, a way in um, and then also supporting the work in terms of um, you know, attending things like this, uh, you know, coming to talks, uh, talking about it, sharing the research, doing your research papers on things like this uh, can be really helpful. Um, yeah, I think. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Anne. I, um, I, I'd sort of uh, second all of that. So uh, we have research assistants and research associates, um, people who are very skilled in putting together research studies and all of the regulatory approvals that need to go with that. Obviously, we have a pair of therapists, and I want to say a thing or two more about that. And then we have people like overnight night sitters, and then you would have independent raters to look at the data and that kind of thing. But um, it's a much broader team than that, because we work with pharmacists, um, we work with solicitors and lawyers, and we work with uh, research departments, and all of the legal um, stuff and the academic stuff that goes with that. So it's a very broad field. But I just want to concentrate a little bit on the, the qualifications of a psychedelic therapist, because I get so many emails saying I'd love to do this. You know, and some of them like, oh, I really want to be a psychedelic therapist. And I'll say, what, what, you know, what, do, you, what do you do or why? And they'll go, because I love taking LSD. And it's like, well, okay, that's, we, we need to be a bit careful about where we go here. Now, on the one hand, it shouldn't, like I said before, it shouldn't be something that's very... Okay, I mean, I guess while we're waiting for him to uh, connect back into the feed, is there anybody else that wanted to comment on that? Uh, yeah, so I would like to... Um, so the question was uh, about how uh, the specific positions, what, uh, what uh, we can afford to the people. So I'm not sure was the was the audience uh, like uh, if they are mental health professionals or or like uh, people from with other expertise. Um, yeah, so for sure, uh, currently we are looking uh, for for people to help with the with putting together the Beyond Psychedelics conference. And uh, there is just variety of positions like either either you are you work in uh, in PR or or you are an expert, or you uh, are good in organization, or logistics, or, or anything else. So, uh, so I think we can just uh, find the right position for, for anyone who is uh, interested. And uh, the main reward is, uh, is just uh, simply to be part of uh, the beautiful team we have here in Prague. And uh, another thing uh, more focused on research, uh, so yeah, at the National Institute of uh, Mental Health, I, uh, I have a few projects, uh, ongoing projects, uh, and uh, for sure uh, we appreciate help with that. Um, so we can offer the, some kind of internships at the, at the institution. Um, not uh, currently not really paid positions but if uh, if someone can uh, get the funding for for trip uh, to come to prague it's uh, it's uh, pretty cheap living here and uh, it's beautiful and we have again a uh, great uh, team and we are doing many things connected with psychedelics great yeah that sounds like a great opportunity and there's um seemingly more and more conferences related to the subject as well so um, i think that's good to emphasize as well that that's an avenue for people to at least gain experience of anything. And I think we have uh, Ben back. Uh, ben, have you rejoined us? Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, I reckon it's probably the feds tapping in and shutting us down. <laughs> <laughs> Must be. 
Um, yeah, no, I was just talking about, I was just talking about trying to really emphasize, this is my own personal opinion, the, the qualifications for therapists, because I have, I have a bit of a, I'm going to upset people here because I have a bit of a fear of, of underground therapy. And there are some tremendous underground therapists, of course, and this is a field that's been going on for the last 50 years. Whilst the ban of psychedelics has been in place, there's been some tremendous therapists providing underground therapy. But there's also a lot of problems that can go with unregulated therapy. And I, I quite like the idea that with regulated clinical work of any kind, you know when you go along to a professional, whether it's a doctor, a physio, a occupational therapist, social worker, or any, any kind of clinical role, um, you know that they're a member of a regulatory body, that they have supervision, that they um, are accountable to somebody, that they have to be uh, regulated um, in, in a database, and all of those things. And I think those things are important when we're working with vulnerable people. So. Um, going forward in terms of training psychedelic therapists, I think there has to be a certain amount of rigor that goes into this and how we select this, because this is a very fragile situation that we're going to be in. And the eyes of the world are going to be upon us. And we really cannot afford to have any gross negligence and mistakes being made by untrained or unregulated um, or unauthorized therapies. Now, I know that that is an inflammatory thing for me to say for a great many people who practice good underground therapy, but I also hear very many stories of poor underground therapy. And we, we, we see these a lot actually in the press um, around drug tourism and these kinds of things. Now, we just need to be careful because we want these patients to not be harmed. And crucially, we want this field to develop in the public eye um, in a way that keeps it going. That there are a great many people who are looking for any excuse they could find to shut this down. So we need to be cautious in the way we go forward. What's quite good about this model, certainly that MAPS has embraced, but it goes back a lot further than MAPS, with a male-female, or not necessarily male-female, but a co-therapist pair, is that you can afford to have one of the pair with more academic qualifications and clinical qualifications than the other half. The other half can be someone who is being in, in training or being supervised. So it does give you quite a lot of flexibility for less highly qualified people to come in and, and begin a career in psychedelic therapy. Great. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, qualifications and making sure that everyone goes through this uh, intact is I think, very important and um, harkens back to what Trevor was mentioning about uh, making sure you're doing the inner work as well. Uh, you don't want anything coming up out of yourself, any transference and session. Uh, that could really go against the efficacy of that treatment and you know give some unneeded bad press uh, as you mentioned you know anything happens bad with mdma it's on the front page of the newspaper so uh, that is something to be avoided for sure and yeah. uh, bring david into this conversation as well because uh, you've been sitting there so patiently and we've been focusing on the academic side of things i'm wondering if you have any input on what sorts of careers are available for people in the arts and humanities and technology um, writing and otherwise Sure. Well, I'm most uh, most in involved with writing, obviously, at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of musicians that have a psychedelic bent toward them, um, and music festivals that that feature those type of mus uh, musicians, um, and uh, artists like Alex Gray and Allison Gray, as far as like visionary art goes, and Pablo Amaringo with the ayahuasca work that he does. Um, I think there's there's plenty of ways to put your own creativity um, out in the world and and shine a or, you know look through a psychedelic lens um, with that creativity. So um, it's it's really all about just figuring out what your talents are and cultivating them, and then um, figuring out a way to present them to the world uh, and and hopefully make a positive impact on on other people. And do you have any input on um, future careers that might be available? Um, for example, I can perceive some interesting uh, integrations of psychedelics with, say, virtual reality technologies, maybe even like virtual reality uh, therapy, which also has been shown to be uh, rather productive for post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, maybe programming or anything of that sort. Uh, is there anything tech-related that you can see of uh, being interesting or useful in a future career path for people? Hmm. Uh, I'm not too familiar with uh, with with that, to be honest with you. But um, it, it certainly sounds interesting. 
Um, I, I think if, if you have a talent in, in technology and you have a talent for programming or coding or something like that, that you could build an application uh, that, you know, could educate people about psychedelics or give someone maybe a uh, technologically synthesized uh, psychedelic experience, perhaps. Um, I, I, ha I don't have any experience with, with uh, combining technology with, with psychedelics, but it definitely sounds pretty interesting. Uh, cool, yeah, I thought you might have had some uh, insight on that, so if anything pops up, um, feel free to chime in about that. Um, but related to your writing, I'm wondering, uh, do you have any tips for maintaining a blog, any writing tips for people for maintaining on track with that? Um, how does one do that successfully? Um, I think it's just like anything else. Uh, it's, it's basically uh, a matter of practicing uh, often. Uh, and, uh, you know, writing every day is pretty important for me. Um, making sure that I, I have two weekly columns that I do that just uh, are the bare minimum writing work that I do um, to keep me going and, and keep me in practice. Uh, and it's the same thing. You could apply that to, to music as well uh, or art. You know, if, if, if you play a musical instrument, it's really important to just practice and keep up your skills. Uh, same thing with art. Um, yeah. Yeah, so lots of motivation is really what's needed here, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so Trevor, I'm interested in your experiences trying to um, get Ibogaine uh, as a therapy uh, modality utilized in uh, the work that you do. Uh, what are the sorts of legal experiences that you've had? Uh, has anyone given you a hard time for that? Uh, um, I've actually had really great interactions with Health Canada. Uh, Ibogaine was was a natural health product. So it was on the natural health product list within Canada. And being on that list, I was able to work with it um, in the few interactions that I had with Health Canada. It was just regarding the importation of the medicine. And we got over a few of those hurdles and the medicine was coming in fairly easily. As of May of last year, Ibogaine was put on the prescription drug list, however, so it's almost in a regulatory twilight zone. So while it's on this pr prescription drug list, which is where I believe it should be, because as a natural health product, it shouldn't be dangerous. And like I said, Ibogaine is potentially dangerous. So it's on the prescription drug list. And that means that it does need to kind of get that Health Canada approval through stage one, two, and three clinical trials in order to be made available as a prescription within Canada. So with this uh, cryptocurrency project that I'm working on, again, I hope that there is going to be enough money so that we can push some of those studies forward and have it completely readily available within Canada. In the meantime, there's something called the Special Access Drug Program within Canada, which is for example, maybe you're, uh, you've got cancer, you've tried everything in order to beat that cancer, nothing is working, so you want to try something from China that maybe isn't regulated, you're able to apply through the special access drug program, and we suspect that we'll be able to use Ibogaine that way as well. I have actually, since May, I've not been operating Liberty Root on a, on a bringing in clients on a weekly basis kind of basis. So we've just been uh, kind of taking a step back and looking at what we can do to move that regulatory stuff forward. But I, like I said, I've had really great interactions with Health Canada overall. They've been fascinated in what I do. Um, you know, I didn't mention this earlier, but we have, Ibogaine seems to have anywhere from a 50 to 75% success rate treating hardcore opiate addicts. And in the face of this opiate addiction, you know, people are interested in alternative solutions. So I, uh, I kudos to Health Canada because they seem to have a lot of very cool people working there that are open minded enough to, you know, they didn't shut me down <laughs> three years ago. So I, I, I appreciate everything that they have done for me so far. And hopefully, you know, I find with bureaucrats, as long as they, as long as they know which box they need to fit you in as long as you can fit in their box properly they're comfortable with you so just uh you know find that box and bend bend a little bit if you need to in order to get into there is what i think i did 
but um, yeah, it's it's been great so far, and I look forward to bringing it forward even further. Right. So that's interesting because um, psychedelics often are used as something to get outside of the box, but uh, yeah. people got to put things back in the box. Yeah. Um, and that's amazing that you've had such good experiences with them as well. Um, are there any other um, plant teachers or uh, compounds that you know of that similarly similarly are on the natural health list that could be used in a setting like that or on the prescription uh, medications? Um, pe peyote, the cactus itself, mescaline is scheduled. Peyote, the cactus itself is not scheduled. I know that. Um, I have some colleagues who are working towards some angles on psilocybin and using that here within Canada. Mark Hayden is working on a map study for that as well. Um, you know, somebody mentioned, David mentioned salvia earlier. That is now unfortunately on that restricted list, but that is one heck of a powerful teaching medicine as well. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've worked with many of the substances, you know, treating alcoholism with LSD, for example. Canada had one of the biggest studies of that ever, as I believe Ben mentioned, in uh, Weyburn, Saskatchewan. So, I don't know, as I said earlier, I just think we need to get rid of prohibition overall is what I think would help the situation a lot. And I feel like, uh, you know, to get a little woo-woo, I feel like I know we are all very powerful manifestors. So let's hold in mind what we would like to see and then work towards that, especially in conjunction with psychedelics and psychedelic therapy. Um, you know, I feel like my whole career was kind of was grown out of uh, a dreaming too big for myself, you know, L having a really grand goal of seeing what I could do to help this neighborhood called the downtown east side and end as much suffering as I could there and I think it's because of this kind of grandiose goal that a whole bunch of these other pieces have come together so I suggest that we hold in mind some grandiose goals on how we would like to see this and then uh, hopefully that'll manifest around us. Right so it sounds like um, for people looking for things here and now Ibogaine might be one of the more realistic ones but keep sites forward. <laughs> And I'm interested as well in the sorts of community effects that you've seen uh, in that uh, East neighborhood that you've been working in. Uh, could you comment on sort of how you've seen people's healing experiences ripple out in the community? Um, well, it's, you know, the, the few people that we have helped, their lives have been completely changed. So basically we're starting, starting with some very compelling stories. As I said, to, you know, that first gentleman that we worked with, he has, uh, you know, he was homeless when we first met with him and then he thought he had a housing situation that was sorted out. And <clears throat> after we treated him, he actually ended up in a shelter as well. And now he's at a point where he's got $5,000 saved up. He's got an apartment and he wants to be an investor. So that's a pretty compelling story. We're working now with uh, Van Du to launch kind of a version 2.0 of this project, which is going to include actually paying people the stipend. That's the way that Vandu works is they, they uh, will give people a $5 stipend to come to these meetings that are oriented around harm reduction. And we didn't give them a stipend for the first round of this Ibogaine project, and we are planning on doing it for the next round. So it's still, unfortunately, that, that neighborhood, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's doing worse now than maybe we've ever seen it because of this opioid crisis, because of the fentanyl. Um, you know, it's sadly the people, a lot of the people that I spoke to two years ago at Van Du aren't alive anymore. You know, there is such a rotating group of people that go through this neighborhood and this organization. So, um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm also working with Gabor towards, you know, perhaps doing some kind of a, a broader kind of compassion for addiction and compassion for addicts in that neighborhood. So it's, yeah, there's still a long way to go, man. I wish we could say that we've made a massive impact down there, but that definitely isn't the case. We've, we've made a massive impact on a few lives, which has been very rewarding and I'm sure they're very grateful for it, but there's a lot more work to do in that neighborhood in particular. Right. Well, 
definitely good luck with that. It sounds like you have your hands full with that project. Um, now we've only got about 14 minutes until we're going to move on to the question period. Um, one thing that I want to sort of go back to is what sorts of uh, avenues for therapy or uh, novel therapeutic uh, methods that we haven't seen being integrated with MDMA or other psychedelic therapies uh, might be useful to research. Uh, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. You mentioned uh, cognitive processing therapy was something that you were looking into. Is there anything else that you think would be useful for people to be doing research in? Anything that might particularly work well with psychedelic research and therapy? Yeah, so I think, so we've been testing, as I mentioned, so this couples therapy, it's a cognitive behaviorally based one. And then cognitive processing therapy is also a cognitive behavioral cognitive behavioral individual treatment for PTSD. Um, and I think, you know, these, the reason why we're using these is that they are, they are areas of expertise, but also that we think that the combination of these two approaches of talking about your thoughts and feelings in a very here and now focused manner um, as a setup and a context for then having the MDMA session can be very helpful. So if we think of these ideas of the preparation and integration, um, having a framework around them that we could see this as being um, makes sense as a model to use. Also, um, so Barbara Rothbaum and her team in uh, at Emory in the US are going to be studying prolonged exposure with MDMA. So it's another cognitive behavioral treatment. Um, so and this is the first time that we've been putting together, you know, evidence-based standalone treatments with MDMA. Um, so I think there's lots of room for other things to be tested as well. I think it's even the principle that we would be using something else with, um, a psychedelic of any form would be, is worth looking at investigating because really if we can increase or we can, um, improve in any way, any of the treatments that we currently have, then that would be ideal. So I think there's lots of room and really it's a, it's a nascent field in terms of what we're using and what we're combining it with. And I think because of all the great work that's come before in terms of the psychedelic renaissance of being able to even be in this place where we can legally be doing this research again, um, there is so much to be answered. So it's a, it's a wide open field is my answer to that. Right, so we'll just have to map out the space as we go. Right. And uh, yeah, did anybody else want to comment on that? Any ideas? Of yeah, I was just gonna, I'll just second what Anne said. It really is a wide open field. It's sort of, if you think about it, this, this work was trundling along really well between sort of 1955 and 1967 or eight. And then it all ground to a halt. And just imagine where we might be in both clinical medicine and in neuroscience and our understanding of these, not to mention socially had that hiatus not happened, had those dark ages not been thrust upon the community. So it really is an open field. There are so many studies that could be done and so many ways in which psychedelics could be used and applied to all facets of society. Um, and we're gonna be broadening the diagnoses as well. I mean, like I said, with MDMA, it's pretty much been confined to PTSD, but there's no reason why it should be. And also, there's no reason why these, these treatments should be confined only to treatment-resistant populations. I mean, that's a typical thing when introducing any new innovative, innovative research. It's, it's not a level playing field. You always have to do it on the worst, most difficult patients that no one else wants or can treat. That's, when you, that's the sort of patients you kind of go in with these in, innovative treatments. There's no reason why MDMA therapy should be fourth or fifth line in treating PTSD, it could be first line and also for addictions. So we really can expand the way in which these substances can be used clinically, which does make it a wide open field. Um, and then also you look at the non-clinical uses and the work with uh, creativity and the work that's been going on with microdosing. Um, it's a very, it's a fertile ground. So, you know, the purpose of this, this career day that we're doing here is to try and spark the imagination of young people that whatever your profession, whatever your field, whatever your interest, there's a way to develop a career in psychedelics. Great, thank you so much for your input on that. Uh, now before we move on, did anybody else want to address that question quickly? Because uh, I think after that we will move on to the question period and open it up to uh, the floor here, Toronto and elsewhere. I'll just throw in that uh... 
a couple Octobers ago, I spoke at a psychedelic psychotherapy forum and I did a presentation called psychedelic entrepreneurship. And it was uh, basically a 45 minute long presentation where I did outline a whole bunch of tips and suggestions on what people might do if they did want to get into the field of uh, working with psychedelics. So I think if you search on YouTube for Trevor Miller, psychedelic entrepreneurship, you'll find that I can, I'll post a link here in the comments as well, but it's, it's pretty chocked full of information, but uh, I think it, uh, it was well received at the time anyway. Great, thanks so much. And I'm sure people would also appreciate if you uh, have that resource on hand and throw it in the chat. Um, I've seen some people asking about that. I'm sure that would be helpful and appreciated. Um, great, so uh, thanks everyone so much. Uh, we have about an hour left, and so we're going to field questions uh, from the global community here. I think we'll start with a question in Toronto. Uh, anybody has anything? Now is the time. Uh, yes, sit back. My question, partially follow up to uh, comment on the qualifications of therapists looking to uh, work in the context of psychedelic assisted therapy. And I was just wondering if uh, you or perhaps um, any of the other panelists could comment on what some of those avenues might look like, practically speaking. So whether that's training right through something like psychiatry or clinical psychology or social work or, or other realms and, and what might give rise to qualifications um, in, a, in a feasible and uh, appropriate uh, great. So the question was uh, directed to Ben. It was related to uh, the qualifications for people who want to be uh, facilitating psychedelic psychotherapy. Uh, specifically, what sort of training avenues would lead to someone having the right sorts of credentials? Would social work, uh, clinical psychology, psychiatry, um, of those avenues, what would you recommend for people looking to become qualified? Um, okay, thank you. It's a good question. And it's one I touched on earlier. I mean, in my in my opinion, I think that it's being some kind of a clinician, a person who is um, comfortable with and trained in working with the patient population. Um, but that's a very broad field. That's everything from doctors to nurses to psychotherapists to counsellors to clinical psychologists to psychologists to um, occupational therapists, physiotherapists. Um, there's a great many different... Um, professions within the clinical service and so I think having one of those um, one of those qualifications is really important because that's where you learn the bread and butter of the the clinician patient relationship the essential aspects such as consent consent confidentiality safeguarding supervision those kinds of things are, are common to all those professions so I think that's the starting point um, Having said that, um, as I said, because you've got this co-therapist pair, you can afford to have one of the half of the pair in one of those professions, and the other half could be something else altogether. So it's difficult because it, it makes it sound as if I'm being very exclusive and restrictive. But like I said before, it's, it's my personal opinion that as we go forward, I think we, if we're working with vulnerable people who have clinical syndromes who are risky, I think it's somewhat devaluing to the whole clinical profession to suggest anyone can just walk in and do this. Um, anyone can, but they need to go through the regular, they need to go through the right regulations and training. Um, you know, there's a reason why we train so much to work with such vulnerable people because these vulnerable people deserve a, a very, uh, a skilled and experienced person, not somebody who hasn't jumped through the hoops. So, I think the simple answer is some form of clinical training, but it doesn't have to be medicine or psychology. It could be one of these other health professions as well. Uh, great, thanks so much. So I'm going to yield the question from the chat. Oh, sorry, did somebody else want to comment on that? Uh, sorry, I heard you. Yeah, I would like to comment on that. Like I was, uh, I remember when I was asking once uh, Professor Stan Grove, who is uh, maybe the most experienced uh, clinician who has worked with psychedelics uh, uh, ever, and uh, about what he thinks is the best uh, background to for the psychedelic therapist or for the people working with psychedelics, and he told me that uh, that he thinks that. Uh, mm, that there is actually no education which is suitable uh, to prepare us uh, to be a psychiatric therapist. That e even if you uh, study psych, uh, if you are a psychiatrist or, or psychologist, 
uh, that it can actually limit you because uh, because you learn something about about the humans. Uh, but uh, with psychedelics, you start to to work also with uh, with different realms. And uh, so I believe that uh, that we need actually to develop the new educational system. Uh, that it is the new uh, profession, new position, and uh, that we need just to to yeah to develop the the new. Um, new university program to uh, to train this uh, kind of uh, of therapist and uh, yeah so i think we can start with uh, with at least providing some upgrade some uh, some like uh, um, follow up education uh, like uh, psychedelic psychotherapeutic uh, training or, or this kind of uh, yeah thing to prepare us at least uh, in some way to to do this kind of work Um, great, thanks for uh, that input as well. Is there anybody else who wants to get in on that question before we move to the next? Okay, excellent. So I'll field one of the questions from our chat here. Um, this is from Lee Watson, uh, and just a note uh, to everyone on the webinar as well, if you want a specific person to have your question addressed to, uh, just also include that in your question, and I can make sure that gets directed uh, as you had intended. So Lee Watson asked, in addition to personal work with psychedelic medicines, what are some ways to learn or build necessary skills outside of traditional educational systems? And that was just sort of broadly directed. So if anybody wants to uh, add to that, um, Rita, that sounds like it touches on some of what you had mentioned as well. Um, would you like to perhaps start commenting on that? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, understand clearly the question. Could you repeat it? Yeah, sure. So uh, we've just been talking about uh, more uh, institutional and uh, educational things within a system, uh, you know, going to a school for psychiatry, uh, getting a degree and that kind of thing. Uh, this person wants to know outside of traditional educational systems, outside of a university or something of the sort, uh, what sort of uh, skills or experiences could be useful for working with yeah. uh, psychedelic medicines. Yeah, yeah. So I believe uh, it needs to be some uh, some kind of uh, holistic education, as uh, Ben uh, mentioned, the holistic centers. So right now we have psychologists who focus on uh, on psyche. We have uh, uh, medical doctors who uh, who are biologically oriented mainly, and uh, and then uh, we we don't know nothing about uh, spirituality, for example. And so I believe that we need, uh, we just need uh, some part of uh, of all of that, and uh, and also to to have some understanding of uh, of the social work and uh, on all like the whole social system because uh, it's also not just about different levels of uh, of individuals, but uh, but also individual as a part of the of the society. And I think that uh, that we just should work uh, with all those uh, aspects. To, to, to provide a successful treatment. And uh, I think that uh, essential is also the self-experience. We have already uh, realized that in the uh, in 60s, uh, it was the, the compulsory part to have your own psychedelic experiences uh, to be uh, um, able to officially uh, provide LSD or other psychedelics to, to other people. And for me, it's still uh, surprising that uh, that nowadays we uh, we just don't talk about that almost at all. That uh, nowadays uh, those who are the only ones who can uh, provide uh, legally psychedelic uh, therapy or or psychedelics to to healthy volunteers are medical doctors, psychiatrists, or psychologists uh, who actually doesn't need to have any of the psychedelic experience. And I think it's uh, it's pretty interesting because also when we uh, look on the traditional societies, uh, so the, the main education was uh, the main part of training was uh, basically using the, the psychedelics and by that uh, learn how to work with that, not just studying books or, or going to the universities. And I think also it doesn't need to be just taking psychedelics, but uh, but to train ourselves like. To, to work with consciousness, to, to meditate, to, to, to use another uh, techniques uh, to alter consciousness. Uh, great, thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's a very important part, that sort of spiritual inner work, uh, gaining education from yourself. 
uh, seems very important in this, and it's been a bit of a theme that we've been working with uh, throughout. Uh, so I have another question here, um, unless anybody else wants to comment on that first. I would just say books, you know, any books you can get your hands on. Um, the Secret Chief was mentioned. The Healing Journey by Claudia Naranjo is an excellent one. Uh, James Fadiman's book is excellent. Anything Stanislav Grof wrote. There's, there's a lot of books that have been written about this, even things like the Harvard Psychedelic Club and seeing kind of some of those early days with Timothy Leary and Ram Dass. So uh, kind of immerse yourself in the culture and figure out who these trailblazers were that came before you is a great way to go. Right, and I'll maybe just add one more thing to that. Um, you know, in the cannabis sector, we're now starting to see some of the colleges and universities starting to offer um, formal programming, develop formal programming, you know, in, in this space, but that has not been the case so far or up until now, really. So I would say, uh, you know, to kind of build off of what the others have said, you know, finding opportunities to get involved, even if it's from uh, an adv advocacy perspective, um, you know, volunteer, getting just as much experience as you can in, in perhaps informal channels. And, um, and then also identifying, you know, what transferable skills you might have, looking ahead to how the industry might develop, what transferable skills you might have, and how um, you could even perhaps take a leadership role in helping to uh, evolve, evolve the space overall. Uh, great, thank you for that, Allison. Um, so uh, if there's no one else who wants to jump in, I will go to the next question now. Okay, looks like we're good. Uh, so I received another question from Toronto um, during the presentation previously. Uh, so I wanna get this one for the individual who uh, had submitted that earlier on. So this one, uh, the first question here is directed to Trevor. Um, we're wondering where did you uh, get the iboga from? Is it more sustainable and uh, could you, is it possible to sort of grow it sustainably here in Canada? Yeah, actually UBC has a huge, uh greenhouse filled with iboga that is tied to Dennis McKenna's company and they're looking at different ways to uh, turn that into ibogaine legally. It may have to actually get shipped out of Canada in order for that process to happen. But um, yeah, I there was a company called Phytostan Nutraceuticals which sold a product called Remagen which was Ibogaine HCL which was derived from a plant called Vokonga Africana. There are sustainability issues with Iboga and uh, there's a, some organizations that are dedicated towards making sure that Iboga is used sustainably. One of the ways around that is to pull the Ibogaine molecule from other plants that are not uh, endangered. And that's what Remagen does for Ibogaine using this Vokonga Africana. There are another couple of uh, suppliers in South Africa who do this the same way. Um, but ultimately, because of where it stands in this kind of regulatory gray zone within Canada, it's not easy to import within can to get it into Canada right now. So it's, uh, yeah, there's still a ways to go so that we're going to be able to do that again since it's been put on the prescription drug list. But, you know, the internet is a great tool for finding things these days is how I'll leave it. <laughs> Great, I think that is all that we need to know for the most part. Um, yeah, on the internet again, in relation to what was being mentioned about books and educating yourself, um, sounds like the best resources that you have in this day and age are yourself and the internet. The information uh, is almost quite literally infinite. So it's an exciting aspect of being at this time in this movement. So I have, um, I'll field another question. It looks like we had most of our questions answered. Um, so there was one that disappeared that I wanted to ask, hold on. Can I, um, can I just come in with a point as well? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I've just been going through quite a lot 
lot of the questions that have been coming up in the um, chat feed here and in the Q&A feed. And quite a lot of people are, you know, asking about um, where people get a broader education um, as well as just the sort of traditional medical model. And I think that's really important. And like I said before, you know, all of us involved in this field as medics are keen to tackle the medical model. Um, you know, we're, we wouldn't be involved in this field if we weren't those kind of holistic, broad-minded doctors. Um, and, and I know that a lot of people feel very unhappy about the medical model and they, they want to challenge it. And so they should. And it's good to see that. But in, I'm somewhat sort of a, this is somewhat of a disclaimer then, sort of defending the medical model and myself as a medic in that if we weren't these holistic kind of doctors, we wouldn't be interested in this field at all. And in my experience, most psychiatrists are very holistic. They, are, uh, they wouldn't be doing psychiatry if they weren't interested in people and society and social work and um, all of and, and the environment and uh, social issues like poverty and all these things. That's why we do this job. So I think most psychiatrists are already there. But I think what, what this highlights is you, I think you do, this is my personal opinion, I think you do need to have an underpinning in the scientific aspects as well. And simply having an enthusiastic enjoyment of the drugs or even, um, even in a broader way, uh, a kind of trans, uh, transpersonal or transcultural appreciation of the drugs. When, when you think about these as medicines, um, you know, when I go to my doctor and I have hypertension and, and she says, take this drug for hypertension. I'm not going to be satisfied if she says, if I say why, and she says, oh, because I took it and it's really good. You know, that's not the answer I'm looking for from my, my family doctor when they prescribe a medicine to me. What I want them to say is, because it's been tested on 10,000 people and here are all the studies, and I studied for years to come to an informed decision around this, that's why I think you should take this medicine. So whilst attacking the medical model is a valuable thing, let's not attack it so much that we throw it out. And uh, I always kind of want to make that point. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's very important to uh, mention, and especially probably reassuring to many of the audience that a lot of psychiatrists are already there, in fact, concerned with these more holistic social issues. Thank um, you. Yeah, so, so I'm, a, I'm afraid I have to, I have to duck out now, I'm afraid. Um, I'm sorry about, I'm sorry that I'm having to leave you early, but I'm flying out early in the morning to um, a conference in South France. So um, uh, do forgive my absence now. Yeah, well, thank you so much for being here uh, with us as long as you've been able to, and good luck with that. And um, you can contact me through my website, doctors, uh, um, Dr. com, and uh, you can, I'm happy for anyone to, to contact me directly, and I'm, I'll send them papers and everything else they ask for, so. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks very much. Good luck with it. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
it's the music that has kind of grown out of their use of that medicine. It's very, uh, very powerful music. And then at the same time, uh, for some of the other sessions and other medicines I work with, there's, I generally do put together a great playlist. And recently what I've been using is uh, the Johns Hopkins team who has done most of the psilocybin studies, I believe, they have put on Spotify their playlist that they use for their uh, psilocybin sessions. So it's about five hours long and it's mostly classical music, but very moving, deeply compelling. It, uh, I tell the people I work with that, that it's the music, it, you, it may not be your bag. It may not be the kind of music that you like listening to, but it's there very specifically for a reason to take you to perhaps some territory that you wouldn't go if you were listening to your own playlist kind of thing. So I've also heard, and I, I looked for it the other day and couldn't find it, but I hear that there's an app that's been put out that has a, a playlist of music for psychedelic therapy as well. So somebody asked about technology earlier, I think that's uh, a neat thing, music to an app that can guide you through a session as well. Yeah. Trevor, that's Mendel's app, actually. It's great. Oh, is it? Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to write that down. I was looking yeah. everywhere for it. There's a feature in Rolling Stone on it, if anyone wants to look at it. Great. So it sounds like there's a good place for music therapy, but there's already lots of competition in that. Um, and yeah, if you want to also um, share with our participants here uh, a link, if you have that available for that app, uh, I'm sure that would be something that would be appreciated as well. And so I want to take another question from our live audience here in Toronto. Um, and for the person who submitted two questions, I will get to that one. I just want to give everyone else a chance. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to um, ask at this time? Oh, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> I still look like there was maybe a hand over here. All right, so we have um, another question for Anne's clinical research. Uh, you said you're working with couples. Are you permitted to speak about whether any of these couples have a history of domestic violence? And if so, do you have any information on whether it's an effective form of treatment for reducing domestic violence in relationships? Yeah, so we, um, we don't include severe domestic violence um, within our couple sample, um, and mostly because the reason for that is that we want that to be under control first before someone would undergo trauma-focused treatment, um, because the trauma-focused treatment can bring up uh, anger, irritability, other strong emotions. So um, we do screen for uh, domestic violence, um, and there's, um, kind of lower levels we need to we just ensure that there hasn't been anything that's occurred within several months before the um the treatment starts so yeah so we can't actually answer the question about if it improves it um we don't see any increase in domestic violence or any type of you know uh, interpersonal violence between uh the participants as the study goes on or afterwards. Um, but yeah, but we can't answer the question of does it make it better, but we know it doesn't make it worse. Uh, great, thank you for that. Um, and I do know that there was a study published uh, out of UBC, uh, which was just a correlational study looking at populations, so not doing any really experimental manipulation, but they did find that um, there was a correlation between psychedelic use and reduced instances of domestic violence. Um, so there is a resource, uh, I can't remember the authors now, but that was published at the UBC. You can take a look at the thoughts that people have on that. So we have a question uh, from our online Q&A uh, from Tanya. Uh, Tanya is wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on the use of psychoactives specifically for religious purposes? For what purposes? I'm sorry? Uh, religious, religious or spiritual okay, purposes. So, okay, thank you. I think uh, the Good Friday experiment was the first time that that was, was studied, and that was Timothy Leary in the basement of a church giving half of the group niacin and half of the group uh, mushrooms. And from what I 
here they all had all the people that took the mushrooms had pretty profound religious experiences wow. that forever changed their lives. And then Rick Doblin, then that was one of his first studies as he recreated that Good Friday experiment. And same thing, <clears throat> saw tremendous transformations in people. And the Johns Hopkins, one of those studies that I saw recently as well, were studying those spiritual aspects as well. But I think that's really you know, what, uh, what these tools were traditionally used for. And we, you know, we may, I think there's, there's kind of a ladder and at the bottom of that ladder might be things like personal development or healing traumas or, um, you know, getting over anxieties. And it, that same ladder has those higher spiritual experiences on it. So I think, I think that's kind of what this work is overall is we are, these are spiritual tools and whether we put that in a language that makes us a bit more comfortable or allows us to speak to Western science a bit more easily by labeling it, uh, you know, healing trauma. I think doing something like healing trauma is doing something on a spiritual level, helping a person on a spiritual level that way. So I think Anne Shulgin, Sasha Shulgin's wife, in a documentary, Dirty Pictures, which is excellent if you haven't seen it, that was one of the, the main points that she wanted to make is these tools are really only spiritual tools and we can put them in whatever kind of clothing we want to make us comfortable with what they are. But ultimately, that's what these tools are facilitating is spiritual experiences. Right, so in a nutshell, all of these experiences are somewhat spiritual. Uh, it just depends on how you want to talk about it. Um, yeah, was there anyone else who had any thoughts, comments on that? Yeah, it's just, uh, I would just like to point, uh, point to the language we, we use for that, that it's uh, interesting that nowadays we, we used to talk about uh, ego dissolution and uh, interconnectedness. Uh, and basically, we are, we are just uh, describing this uh, uh, spiritual aspect of uh, of uh, psychedelics that yeah for me it's uh, interesting like how how much the the word spirituality is still like denied by the academia currently yeah yeah that is interesting especially when you consider that you know it is a mystical experience that often is the thing that is healing for people um, so yeah one thing that I've always been wondering is um, like why are we focused specifically on like unitive experiences experiences of nothingness when the psychedelic experience is so like rich and full of content. Um, do you have any comments on that, perhaps, um, in your work? Um, have you seen the role of like spiritual content, um, entity contact, uh, visions, and things like that? Uh, is that also something that's useful and perhaps needing to more adequately be integrated into our scientific frameworks to bring this language of uh, spiritual healing uh, more to bear on the research that we're doing? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, uh, basically, maybe this is the, the way to use the new language, which is more understandable for 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 the people currently. Like, uh, yeah, like for example, which I mentioned the the ego dissolution, and just uh, once we uh, um, we learn that this is what psychedelics do, we can uh, we can try to say, okay, but this is basically the the spirituality. And uh, so, yeah, maybe this is uh, this is the way, like how to reintroduce the spiritual aspect to to our society, because uh, we are already not educated in that. We don't talk about that, so uh, so we just uh, should like uh, again uh, realize that this is just a part of our lives. And uh, to the to the um, topic of uh, spirituality and uh, and psychedelics, so. Uh, I also like uh, to um, the effect of uh, psychedelics, which I believe they uh, they have, which uh, which uh, produce this spiritual experience, but that they actually uh, can uh, show us that all the life uh, has its spiritual aspects, and we are more able to to perceive it, to to understand it, to yeah, to be aware of that. Yeah, great, thanks. I think that very thoroughly addresses um, a lot of the things that have been coming up in uh, people's questions up to this point. Um, so I want to return back to Toronto here to see if anybody else has any unasked questions that they'd like to field to the panel. Yes, over here. Um, are there any uh, examples of patients who uh, were resistant to psychedelic treatments 
And if so, what were the circumstances that were obstacles that have caused that resistance? And did you want to direct that to anybody specifically? Um, just in general. No, like they received no benefits from. Okay, so we have um, a general question for the panel. Um, this individual is wondering uh, if there is any evidence or um, people showing up in the research that have shown resistance to treatment um, that, for example, do not have any healing benefit from undergoing psychedelic psychotherapy, and if there might be anything regular about those people uh, that we can identify, uh, maybe psychedelics won't work for that thing, or there's uh, particular uh, individual barriers to uh, treatment. Uh, has that ever come up, and have you noticed anything? Um, I'm thinking of one case in particular, a gentleman contacted me, he had suffered <clears throat> severe abuse at the hands of the church at a very young age, and was an incredibly intelligent guy, and had done years and years and years of work upon himself, and psychedelics kind of came on the radar as a way that he might be able to help, that it might be able to help him. We brought him in for an Iboga session, and... It, it really it really couldn't crack through it um, sometimes if people are have developed incredible defense mechanisms and have thought about their problem enough it, it the, this just wasn't the right tool there was at one point where he started vomiting a little bit and uh, I kind of did a little jump for joy in the in the hallway because I thought we had finally broken through a little bit and it did help help him a little bit, but I could see that uh, Iboga wasn't the medicine for him to continue with. So I was able to put him in touch with somebody that does do MDMA therapy and actually paid for him to go through three sessions with that practitioner. And that was the trick. So it, MDMA for trauma is really a, an incredible tool because it allows that mark, melting of the heart that just allows people to Kind of see their problem with that compassion that MDMA seems to bring. So, I would uh, I would say that some psychedelics are not going to work for certain problems, but I think that there probably is a right tool someplace in that toolbox as long as you're ready to keep working with them and uh, can get them on the right path. And of course, there's regulatory problems to to making that happen in a lot of cases, but uh, thankfully I was able to help this guy in particular. Um, sometimes with Iboga, again, it's it's potentially dangerous, so we haven't been able to work with uh, our medicine specifically because of some pre-existing health conditions, so we've been able to, again, forward them to practitioners that work with other medicines that they have been helpful. So I think like I said, the two, I think the tools are in that psychedelic toolbox someplace. We just need to be willing to, to try out a few of them, perhaps. I can add into that, too. Um, I think a big thing to keep in mind is that it, you know, even for the treatment, so for example, for MDMA for PTSD, so even when we know that a certain you know, compound or medicine or psychedelic may work most of the time. It doesn't work for everybody all the time. And I think that's a really important thing to know and to encourage, be, to encourage knowledge around because when, if it, for some reason it doesn't work, then the hopelessness that goes along with that, if someone, for example, is thinking that's going to be the sure shot or going to be the thing that is like the silver bullet that's going to make it better, that can be very challenging. So um, I think these tools can be, for a lot of people, can be very effective, but we have to be careful in saying that they're uniformly or always going to be effective. So, um, you know, in our preliminary looking at the results from our pilot study, you know, many people lost their diagnoses of PTSD, had improved relationship satisfaction, are doing really well. And then there's a few people who still have PTSD and doesn't mean they didn't have gains and they didn't see change, but they're not quote unquote cured, right? So I think um, 
that's important to keep in mind that I don't think there's anything ever in life that's going to be 100% effective all the time for everything. Um, and a lot of it has to do too with where that person's at, what else is going on in their life, and potentially also, you know, it may also may not be that, you know, when we're doing two sessions of MDMA, maybe it's a third session that will do the trick or a fourth. We don't know the answers to that yet. So um, I think there's lots of pieces to that. Uh, great, thank you. Yeah, I think emphasizing timing is uh, very important in these sorts of things. Um, set and setting, we've known for a long time that that's very important and you know where you're at is very important part of that. Uh, is there anyone else that wanted to weigh in on that question? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would like to. Um, yeah, so in terms of the of the psychedelic effect in uh, in our study, which was not the therapeutic study, but the but Sarah Samin for healthy volunteers, uh, we had one volunteer who, who was uh, resistant uh, to to psychedelics, and uh, and uh, uh, it just looked like that uh, twice he had uh, placebo. Uh, so uh, any, uh, the researchers even couldn't uh, couldn't recognize uh, that like so which uh, which session was uh, with active uh, psilocybin, and I also remember reading about some uh, case uh, by Stan Groff uh, who was uh, describing the person who, who was so resistant to LSD. Uh, I'm now not sure about the exact number, but it was like thousands of uh, micrograms of LSD. Uh, which uh, which he still could uh, could take, and uh, he would just not feel anything. So I think this is uh, this is pretty interesting, and uh, and also um, if we take a look on the psychedelic research, uh, so we can see that uh, that often the the high uh, the results uh, say that uh, um, psychedelics simply didn't change uh, anything from uh, from the studied hypothesis. I know that this is uh, the topic which is not like very popular, uh, not uh, not attractive for media. Uh, so that's why also we want to dedicate the, the special uh, session on uh, on this at Beyond Psychedelics, like to share uh, when actually hypothesis did, uh, fail and uh, when psychedelics didn't do anything. Because like I think uh, that uh, probably most of us know the the this. Um, famous study by Johns Hopkins uh, University that uh, psilocybin produced the, the uh, significant uh, mystical experience uh, and uh, there are some uh, positive changes uh, in the follow-up but when we take a look uh, closer on the study we realize that uh, they were also measuring the, um, the comparing the baseline and uh, and the follow-up and then they realized that uh, that there was no significant uh, change in terms of quality of life and uh, personality and uh, and I don't remember what uh, what else so uh, actually the one of the results is that uh, okay psychedelics didn't do anything but we we don't know about those results because uh, nobody nobody talks about them yeah Great, thanks for your input on that. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next question here, uh, which I have an intuition was directed to Ben, uh, but he has gone and I'm interested to see if anyone uh, here has any information about that. Um, so Rosanna was asking if there's any research taking place in the UK in terminally ill uh, or palliative care populations. Uh, she's interested particularly in psychedelic therapy for end of life anxiety. So I guess just wondering on any updates uh, in Europe about that. To my knowledge, there isn't. Um, that is just from conversations with other researchers, but I could be wrong, but there's nothing actively going on or, or right about to start, to my knowledge. Okay, thanks, Anne. And so we have a question here from uh, Joanne who's asking, uh, what is the current state of integration in terms of its success and career opportunities? Is there research being done on the integration process and what that needs to look like going forward? Uh, I can try to speak to that too. So I'm assuming integration is meaning post uh, psychedelic session or psychedelic experience. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, if, uh, if that's not what the uh, question asker was meaning. But I would say that a lot of what uh, Ben was saying and others have echoed on the panel about the same deal with who would be a therapist in a session should hold for who would be doing integration afterwards, right? So understanding um, 
therapeutically what would be going on or helping that person in a therapeutic way. And so understanding and, and training in some, some modality that has some therapeutic content, I think would be very important to, to assist with that process. And there's different ways it can be done too. So for example, um, you know, we, you know, I do psychedelic integration in as a, you know, therapy session, other people do it um, like talk therapy and other people do it in different ways too. So I have a colleague in Spain, for example, who uses holotropic breath work as an integration tool post uh, psychedelic sessions for folks. So um, but I guess the, the main thing is that there has to be, I would say there should be some uh, therapeutic background to be able to do that really helpfully and effectively for folks. For sure. I think aftercare is very important. There are a few organizations that are uh, kind of training people for that now. I'll, I'll see if I can find it when I'm done here. Uh, but specifically for Iboga, there's an organization that's reached out to me and I know a few of their members who are able to do aftercare kind of via Skype or Zoom sessions and uh, lead people that way. That's one of Kind of the important questions that we ask of people before they come for a session is what kind of aftercare strategy do they have in place and it's going to look different for everyone but we just want that there is some kind of a, a forethought into how a person is going to operate afterwards and what kind of support mechanisms they're going to have in order for that integration to be effective and then a question came up here as well about contraindications for psychedelic therapy and I mentioned that there might be a, a tool in the psychedelic toolkit for everybody's ailment, but that's not necessarily true. There's, there are contraindications, often mental health issues, perhaps severe bipolar, severe schizophrenia. There are, uh, there are times when psychedelics would have to be considered very carefully before you would put them to use. So I just wanted to make sure that was said as well. Uh, when it when it comes to uh, integration after psychedelic experiences, um, I feel like one of the one of the people that may be worth checking out is Neil Goldsmith. Um, he's a psychotherapist based out of New York and uh, also uh, one of the facilitators of the Horizons Conference up there. And um, his, his book, uh, he he wrote a book called uh, Psychedelic Healing, which may have some information that if someone was looking into uh, going the route of uh, becoming like a psychedelic therapist focused on integration, that, that might be helpful to read. All right, thank you everyone for uh, your input on that question. Uh, we have another one on the chat, um, which I think is important to address. Uh, so Emma is asking, does anyone know of any work being done in indigenous settings using ceremony and these particular substances, MDMA, psilocybin, iboga, as um, an indigenous woman working towards using psychedelic therapy in a clinical way to help heal communities. Um, this can be a very sensitive area due to cultural protocols. Um, so uh, is there any research that we know on that particular setting? I got a text this morning actually from Ann Livingston, who I mentioned earlier, who is, uh, she said that there is a native community that is looking for something like we've got. Um, I haven't done too much work specifically with native groups, but it's something that has definitely been on my radar for a while. And then I, and then I do know people that do work in the traditional bleedy way with Iboga. For example, uh, Iboga Soul is a website, ibogasoul.com. They work in the traditional bleedy way, which is kind of the African indigenous way but I know that they've worked with some indigenous people using that African indigenous way as well. There, there are absolutely people, um, I think especially in the US that I know of, um, who are uh, um, doing work with mescaline and peyote in terms of, in, real, in context of um, Native American and Indigenous ways of knowing and within that. Um, I can't think of their exact names, but absolutely, if you look on the website for the Cycle Science uh, Conference, there are definitely talks by some of those researchers and activists. So. 
And another name that comes to mind um, for me now is uh, Bia Labate out of British Columbia. She does a lot of work on indigenous uh, ceremonies in uh, South America. Yeah, exactly. Bia's work, absolutely. And there are, you know, lots of works and writings by folks who are in South America on their own, on their work as well. So I want to really highlight and emphasize that. But very important. Yeah, the universities there, especially like in Mexico, um, do a lot of work in that area. Uh, great. So uh, unless anyone else has anything to add to that, uh, we'll move on to the next question here, um, which is, is there any advice on finding holistic centers where uh, I can study and volunteer? Uh, this person wants to apprentice with a shaman, uh, so if anyone has any input on that, um, that is the question. I'm sorry, can, can you repeat it again? Uh, I spoke to understand. Yes, the question is, um, do you have any advice or tips on finding holistic centers um, where one could study or volunteer and perhaps apprentice with a shaman? I would say kind of, it's hard to, it's hard to give advice around that. I'd say kind of hold that out as your goal and hope the universe puts the right person on your path because it's, uh, you know, I know the shamans that I know, they get kind of peppered for apprentices all the time. And, you know, I would start by doing a lot of medicine yourself, getting in those circles. There are great ayahuasca circles out here in BC. Like, you know, don't come in with the blatant, uh, outright goal of I want to be your apprentice, but start participating in their circles. Find, find cent a center that resonates with you in order to start your own healing journey. And then if it's meant to be that your own healing journey leads to you healing other people, I think that'll become apparent. But, um, you know, just kind of hold it out as a, a broad goal and, and move forward that way. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think whenever um, people talk about this kind of question, usually um, the responses that I hear is that if you're looking for a shamanic or spiritual path, uh, the teacher will come to you when you are ready. Uh, these things work in sort of synchronicities. Um, so like you said, get involved in circles of the sort. And uh, if that opportunity uh, is meant for you, then perhaps it will appear. Uh, did anybody else want to weigh in on that before we move to the next question? Uh, okay, so it looks like um, we're getting pretty close to the end of our time here. Um, so we'll do about two or three more questions, and then I think we will wrap it up for the day. Um, I just want to turn quickly to Toronto uh, to see if we have any questions here that anybody wanted to ask before we wrap up. Um, okay, in the hat at the back. Uh, so the question is, is there any form of ayahuasca that does not include the body? I don't think so. That's part of the game. That's, there's incredible benefit to those purges. It's, you know, emotional release. It's cathartic in the end. It's, it's part of the journey, I would say. I'd say, I'd say try not to avoid that part of it. <laughs> Is my recommendation, but thanks. Yeah, I think that's definitely sufficient for answering that. Uh, so then, yeah. But then, on the other hand, there is you know, there's there's other forms of DMT that you can take. There's smokable DMT, for example, which is you know, it's been said that uh, ayahuasca is kind of walking up a mountain, taking a couple hours to walk up, and then having the peak experience, and then a couple hours to walk down. Whereas smokable DMT is kind of like teleporting yourself to the top of the mountain very quickly. It's still one of the most profound, actually the single most transformative psychedelic experience of my life was that first time that I smoked DMT and there isn't any, there isn't any purging with that generally. Yeah, but there's a trade-off of course, because those are usually a little more intense experiences. Uh, so I want to ask a question here uh, by Lee Watson, uh, who was wondering, what are some established psychedelic conferences that uh, the panelists would recommend attending? Beyond Psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> and that one's coming up soon, is it not? Or it's uh, in the works for this year? Uh, I'm sorry? The... And that's, that's coming up soon this year, isn't it? Yeah, 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 in, uh, in June in Prague. Yeah. And we are still accepting uh, abstracts also for, for next few days. 
if anyone would be interested in attending. Oh, excellent. So for those researchers out there, if you've been doing work on this, uh, definitely get those into that conference. The Plant um, Spirit Medicine Conference in, at UBC every fall. Uh, Stephen Gray is the main face behind that. Uh, Plant Spirit Medicine Conference is very good. I'd like to, to suggest uh, Horizons Perspectives on Psychedelics Conference in New York, which happens uh, every October. And there's also the Psychedelic Science Conference that happens out in California. Um, uh, I also put together like an upcoming psychedelic events um, section of, of a newsletter that I send out on psychedelictimes.com. So if, if you go and sign up for the newsletter there, then you'll see a bunch of upcoming psychedelic events every month. There is also in, uh, in the end of March one uh, conference in, uh, in Mexico, in Jalisco, I think, uh, organized by, by Bia Labate. I'm not sure about name, but it's something like Plantas Sagradas Americas or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's for free and uh, looks pretty, pretty interesting. And there is also a conference here in Toronto um, every year um, that I have to mention. It's a conference that I run. Uh, it's called Mapping the Mind with Mushrooms. And so that will happen next September um, and um, hopefully every September uh, as well. We've been doing it as a yearly thing for part of the 920 movement. Uh, so also in relation to that, uh, on September 20th, uh, there is an international network of people that work on doing psychedelic advocacy events, particularly relating to psilocybin. So, uh, September is a good time to be looking for events like that. Uh, and you can look to, uh, if you just Google the 920 Coalition, uh, they tend to have a list of their events that happen around that time. Also, if anybody's interested in events in the cannabis sector, there's quite a significant number of events, uh, both from the medical side, the consumer side, uh, industry events in Canada, uh, in the U.S., and you know, we're even starting to see them more and more around the world as this becomes more of a global trend towards cannabis legalization. Great, that sounds pretty thorough. Um, any last things to add to that? Uh, the Psychedelic Psychotherapy Forum, which is in Victoria every fall as well. They didn't have it this year, but they did the three years before that. And I believe they're having it again this year. They didn't have it last year, pardon me. Psychedelic Psychotherapy dot, or I'll put the website on the chat here. I don't know. Excellent, thanks. And yeah, so I want to address uh, a question here by Tanya, uh, who's asking, is there any place in the psychedelic community for people who are um, less into certain spiritual beliefs or perhaps somewhat more skeptical? Um, she asks because she's heard a lot about synchronicity and such. Um, not everyone believes in that necessarily. Uh, so do any of the panelists have any uh, input on that, perhaps more secular language areas uh, for people to be involved in? I think so. I. You know, I like the term agnostic because agnostic leaves things up for grabs still, you know, you aren't quite sure, you, aren't, you don't have an, a, an answer. Whereas atheists, atheists seem to know that there's no God. And I don't know, I've, I've treated people who've come in, more than one person who has come in and said, I was an atheist before the, this experience and now I know there's a God. So. If you're an atheist that has a very, very firm belief that you don't want to get shattered, then maybe psychedelics aren't for you. But if you're still open to being revealed the truth, whatever that might be, then yes. And skeptics for sure, like a, a good healthy skepticism. Again, skepticism in its true form leaves something to be figured out still. You're, it's, it's, a, it's doubting, but it's not doubting with the final answer. I think if you've, if you've got this die hard, I know how the universe is and I'm not going to budge from this, then psychedelics might have uh, a few lessons for you, you know? <laughs> yeah, I kind of came to this from, a, from being pretty devout atheist, actually, and through my experiences kind of changed my opinion of that. Uh, so I can relate to the, the people that Trevor's worked with. Um, I think also, you know, there, these things can be, psychedelics can be used for non-spiritual things. I mean, we've talked about a lot of medical applications and stuff like that, but um, James Fadiman did a lot of research um, about using them to solve specific problems. So uh, 
you know, you might have something that you're working on that you've worked on for months and months and months and not got anywhere uh, on and take a psychedelic with the intention to be able to solve that problem or work through it or come to some kind of realization uh, that may happen. I mean, uh, I don't think that spirituality has to be a part of the psychedelic experience. I think that uh, Trevor's probably right. If if you're very adamantly uh, against spirituality and you take a psychedelic, it's it's possible that it may come up in your experience um, unexpectedly. It may shake you a little bit. Um, that's kind of what happened to me. But uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, but yeah, I, th I think there's definitely non-spiritual applications for these these things. Yeah, I certainly would say that um, from our work with MDMA as well. There's, I mean, we as the researchers and with, with the clients are not talking about spiritual experiences or synchronicities or anything like that. And some folks do relate it to their spiritual or religious experiences, but I would say the vast majority don't. And it's actually kind of linked to what David was saying is like, we're aiming at a specific problem or a specific thing that's going on for them. So it tends to be focused more around that experience. Um, yeah, so I think there's lots of space for, I mean, having come in as a, a massive skeptic and, and not knowing anything about psychedelics. And then, you know, and I, I would say I'm still, I, like, I do use the word synchronicity in my own personal life more now that I'm in this world. But I would say that in the context of the work with clients, I tend not to, and um, nor do people raise that necessarily. So. All right, so it looks like everyone's got their input on that. And um, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about like the language of like synchronicity and such as well, because uh, that language is predominantly pragmatic. It's not really meant to be a literal truth of some supernatural force making things happen at the right time. Uh, and even Carl Jung talked about it as an a-causal connecting principle. It's uh, when you see things that fit together at um, a fortuitous moment, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's any uh, causal factor linking those things together. but uh, that doesn't mean that it's any less significant to you as an individual, and that usually when you do find things happening um, according to what you might call synchronicity, um, that's just an indication of how your mind is picking up on meaning in the world, and is an indication of good psychological health uh, more so than it is some principle outside of one's being. So it's more of like an intentional relevance sort of uh, property. Uh, so you can also take sort of a secular and uh, skeptical, if you would like, uh, analysis of that sort of language as well. I, in that psychedelic entrepreneurship presentation that I mentioned earlier, I touch on synchronicity and try and provide a, a rational framework for that as much as is possible. I touch on Jung's work there. So I, I feel like it's, uh, you know, a synchronicity is when an inner experience lines up with an outer experience. And I think if, if you're doing something like goal setting, for example, you're creating this inner subjective goal and then all of a sudden you see the external manifestation of the next step towards that goal. You're like, oh, wow, that's, that's very, that's synchronistic. That's the, that's what I was looking for. So I think uh, as we put together kind of plans for ourselves, synchronicities are bound to happen because it, it's kind of the pathway being unveiled sometimes. And then there's some much more magical experiences of it as well. I'll, I'll tell you one quickly. I was, uh, it's all around psychedelics. I've had incredible experiences of psychedelics being manifested into my life. There was my first time with that DMT experience. I, I uh, had been researching DMT for the first time ever that morning at my boring office job. And a buddy that I was with said, hey, does that store on Commercial Drive still sell cannabis? And he was referring to that urban shaman store I mentioned before. I said, yeah, let's get out of there and go down there. And uh, through an amazing experience, as soon as we got in there, DMT was being offered to me for the first time. So I had never heard of DMT on its own as a specific compound until a couple hours before that. And then boom, it showed up in my lap that day. Another time I was on a a bus to Pavones in Costa Rica. It's the most, most southwest town in Costa Rica, an eight hour bus ride. I happened to mention to the guy that I was standing with, I said, oh, I haven't done, I said hallucinogenics. I don't really year, use that term anymore, but I said, I haven't used, haven't had hallucinogenics in a while. I wouldn't mind some. 
the next day in the one cantina, there's four of us sitting in that cantina in a town with less than 100 people, most of them surfers. A guy walks in and said, hey, some Indians brought some mushrooms down from the mountains for me last night. I turned them into tea. Does anyone want them? So <laughs> synchronicities can be a pretty powerful and magical thing if, you're, if you do leave yourself open for them. Right, and they're at least interesting, if nothing else. Uh, great, so I think we have one more question here uh, in Toronto uh, at the back, uh, and then we're going to wrap it up after that. So go ahead. Um, so my question is primarily to Trevor, but I have heard a lot from the end. I agree with you know, regarding the mind game is really a big example of a very promising drug that has some clearly some clear health risks. So do you see mind the game moving forward as the drug that people are going to be using in the 21st century to addiction, or do you see it as more of a lead compound to uh, so it sounds like you're asking more, is it like sort of a gateway into other things? Yes. Yeah. Do you see it as the drug that we should be developing, or do you see it as it's doing something and we should develop a drug that works like it with that kind of Okay, so, so this question was uh, directed to Trevor um, and then anyone else who might have any thoughts about it. Um, but it was related to the health risks of Ibogaine, because that's um, one of the psychedelic compounds we know of that does have significant health risks and you need to do a lot of uh, preparation uh, and follow up with it. So uh, the question is, uh, would you then see Ibogaine as the drug of the 21st century, as it was so put, uh, in that we should be using that specifically, or is it something that we should be developing compounds like it, but that are safer? Uh, there is, there's been a great attempt to develop a safer compound. I believe it's called 18MC. And I heard that it was that studies were getting underway with it, but I haven't really heard anything since. But that was the primary goal was to try and actually the primary goal was try to try and create the anti addictive property without having that psychedelic experience, which a lot of people aren't, you know, I don't I don't know if that's really the angle that should that people should take meaning the, uh, the psychedelic experience may be the healing aspect of the medicine more than anything else. So um, I know people are working on developing different compounds. I think that's a, a research avenue that should be taken for sure. And at the same time, there is a safe way to use iboga. So I've, I've, I've kind of, I, I often very uh, adamant about the dangers of it because I don't want people messing around with it. But at the same time, there is a safe way to use this medicine and there's there's kind of ultra safe ways to use this medicine as well uh, meaning you can do super low dosing spread out there's a beautiful uh, protocol using methadone so normally because methadone prolongs the QT interval of the heart which is essentially the space in between heartbeats and ibogaine prolongs that QT interval as well you normally wouldn't use those two medicines together so a person would have to come off methadone for at least 10 days before having a large dose of ibogaine. But there's a beautiful protocol that was developed by my friend Claire Wilkins and some doctors in Spain where you can get somebody to a low dose of methadone just by either they're already on that low dose or you can wean them down slowly. And then you just give them a small amount of ibogaine and you do that uh, instead of having methadone that day, and that'll take the withdrawals away for 24 hours or so, then when you go back onto methadone, you only take about half as much. So you can do that once a week, and it's still very safe as far as heart health is concerned. It's not profoundly psychedelic. It's, it's not the full flood dose, but still provides something on that, that level. So I think, uh, I think, uh, to answer your question, it's probably a bit of both. If people can find compounds that are going to be effective, I think we should go down that avenue and look for those compounds. At the same time, I think Ibogaine can be used very safely moving into the future. Uh, great, thank you so much. Um, so are there any final comments that we have from any of our panelists? All right.
looks like everyone has talked sufficiently for today, uh, and it's been a long conversation, so I think that we all have to sort of break, and thank you all so much for coming, uh, and thank you to all of the Toronto Psychedelic Societies for organizing these events uh, and other similar groups. Uh, it was great to be able to integrate everyone and to have this day where we can orient ourselves better into the future of psychedelic research. Um, so once again, thank you, and have a wonderful evening. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Bye.